2023 is coming to an end. This year has been filled with good times, hard times, and endless scary stories. There were monsters, psychos, spirits, but of all those stories I've read from you this year, these are my hand-picked personal favorites, the ones I found the scariest. First, I need to mention that these stories are in no particular order, and I didn't judge these stories based on believability, only by what I personally found scary. Make sure you stop by EerieCast.com or just search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app to enjoy even more scary stories like this, or subscribe here on YouTube if you find yourself enjoying these stories. And if you have one of your own, share your story with me at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Strange Occurrences at My Friend's Graduation Party From Snapping Thrag This is a story of something that happened to me in the middle of the night at a friend's graduation party a few years back. I don't really have any sort of explanation for what happened but I hope deep down that I let myself get scared by some thunder. However, I know in my heart that can't be the case. So I live out in the country in rural western New York. Many of my friends live even farther out into the country than I do. One of these friends, who I'll call Eric, had his high school graduation party at his house, which was basically in the middle of nowhere. This party dragged on into the early hours of the next morning, and Eric had gotten sick of making awkward small talk with parents and teachers, so he suggested we all sneak away from the adults and go swimming in his pond. About eight of us total agreed, driving down the road a few miles to the pond he was talking about. To give you a picture of where we were, imagine a hill big enough and steep enough that it takes about five minutes to walk down. At the bottom of this hill is a small clearing with a pond and a shed. The clearing is surrounded on the other three sides by woods, and on the other side of the hill is miles of Amish country. We parked our cars next to a barn at the top of the hill. Then we made our way down to the clearing. After we'd all stripped down to our underwear, we swam out to a small floating dock in the center of the pond. We spent an hour or two swimming around, trying to flip the dock and whatnot. It was a cloudy night which rendered it almost pitch black out, to the point where I could not make out the details of anyone around me. Basically, they were all just grey shapes, and if I hadn't known them by their voices, I would have never been able to tell them apart. It was at that moment that Eric decided to tell all of us about some of the massive fish they'd just stocked the pond with the week before. One of our friends has a serious phobia of swimming with fish. He began to freak out, making a mad dash for the shore, flailing, splashing, and hyperventilating loudly as he went. Each of us took turns telling Eric what a jerk he'd been as we swam after our panicking friend. We managed to calm him down, then we decided to call it a night. One by one, each of us put our clothes back on and drove home until just Eric and I were left. I couldn't find my car keys. Eric asked if everything was okay, and I didn't want to embarrass myself, so I told him I was just going to be another minute or two, as I just wanted to answer a text. I told him he could just go ahead and drive home. And he did, leaving me there at the barn. As soon as he was out of sight, I turned on my phone flashlight, making my way back down the hill to look for my keys, at the spot where I'd taken off my clothes. About a minute or two into looking, there was this loud boom, like a crack of thunder, that came from deep within the woods. Figuring that thunder was all it was, I continued my search until a minute or two later, when I heard the same exact sound again. Now I need to make it clear, what I heard was not a second boom. It was the same boom, repeated. The two sounds were exactly the same in every way, like a recording being played back. I kept looking until I heard the third and fourth booms, it was only at that point that I was starting to realize this wasn't thunder. All the booms were the exact same sound, and they were coming at even intervals, to the point I was able to predict when they would happen. 
I was also starting to notice they were getting louder. Like, whatever was making those sounds was getting closer. Starting to get freaked out, I turned and made my way back up the hill. I was hoping my keys were somewhere near my car, and I figured in the worst case scenario, I would just wait out this thunderstorm and go back down to look afterwards. On the way up the hill, I began to notice that not only were the booms getting louder, but the amount of time between each boom was becoming uniformly smaller every time. The whole thing was weird, unnatural. I only spent a minute or two searching the ground for my keys before the booms got so loud they triggered something in me like fight or flight. I locked myself into my car, hoping to wait out the storm. At this point, there were only 30 seconds or so between each boom. They were loud enough that I was instinctually lifting my hands about halfway to my head, as if to cover my ears each time. Not knowing what else to do, and fully freaked out, aware that this could not have been thunder, I started to frantically search for my keys, praying I'd left them in my car somewhere. By then, the booms were deafening, and so close together, it was almost just a constant buzz of noise. The next boom would start before the current one was finished echoing. I couldn't even hear my own panicked thoughts as I suddenly noticed the blue fabric of my lanyard sticking out from under the seat. I grabbed the keys, jamming them into the ignition, thankful to be out of this mess. Just as I put the car into drive came the final boom. This last boom was easily twice as loud as the one before it. So loud, it felt like something was physically moving around inside my skull. The car shook, the headlights flickered out, then back on, and I could hear the windows rattling as the echoes died down. After that last boom, everything went back to normal. I sped down the country road until I was two towns away. I then slowed down to the legal speed limit, then drove home. The following day, I asked a few of the other partygoers, as well as Eric, if they'd heard those booming sounds and what they might be. But nobody had noticed any sort of booming sounds or thunder at all that night. Looking into it, I've been unable to find anything that suggests there was even a thunderstorm that night. For all I know, this experience was uniquely mine. It was just me and my car alone in the woods in the middle of the night, with some loud and unnatural disembodied sounds playing on repeat. The Chainsaw Masked Its Footsteps From Neurotica Rampage This story happened back in the year of 2012. I was working as what best could be described as a lumberjack, up in the mountains, many miles from anything that could be remotely described as civilization. My crew had been hired by the government to clear trails and cut fire breaks. For anyone who doesn't know, a fire break is basically clearing the forest floor of dead debris, so that if a fire does start out from a lightning strike or a careless camper, then the fire has a tougher time jumping between trees. Anyway, my crew and I had left the closest town, which was about two hours away, at 6 a.m., a couple of hours later, we arrived at the job site. It was a crisp late spring morning, made even more crisp by the altitude of the mountain we'd found ourselves on. We were a crew of eight, four running chainsaws, four dragging limps. After we checked our saws and fueled them up, we started walking through the woods, where we'd left off the day before. The morning passed us by at a brisk pace. We'd been there for almost two months by then, and the finish line was in sight. We were all pushing ourselves to get this done so we could move on to the next job. That and the government contract we had was slowly ticking closer to the deadline. By midday, we'd all kind of wandered off on our own paths, hitting the various spots that we might have overlooked the first time around, just doing a final cleanup of the particular area. By then, we were so far away from one another the last time I'd seen another crewmate had been an hour or so. The only indication that there was even anybody out there with me was the faint screaming of chainsaws off in the distance. I'd stopped for a moment in a small patch of trees and brush 
and was cutting up some of the deadfall. After about five minutes, I stopped my chainsaw, standing there for a moment. Something felt off. It's really hard to explain all this time later. It would have been almost as hard to explain then, to be honest. But unless you've been in the situation yourself, it's just difficult to express the feeling you get when there's something inside of you screaming, you are in danger. It's a primal feeling built into us. And even though we live in a day and age where it's not so often needed, it's still there, still inside all of us. So I stopped and whirled around. But I saw nothing. Just aspens and pines swaying in the breeze. I stood there and collected myself for a few minutes until my heavy breathing subsided. Then I heard a voice coming from the top of a hill that made me jump. Hey, come on! Come on. It's time for, it's lunch. time for lunch! My boss stood at the crest of the hill, waving at me. I sat my chainsaw next to an old tree stump, so I didn't have to lug it all the way back with me. I then made my way up the hill. On the way back to the truck, my boss and I made some small talk. I was watching you for a minute or two down there, he said. The saw acted like it was running all right. Did you run out of gas when you stopped, or was there an issue? No, I said. No issue, just giving it a rest for a minute. Good, he spoke, slightly relieved. I'd be pretty mad if I spent all that money getting it fixed, just so it could break on us all the way out here. Nope, running like a dream, I said back. Fifteen minutes later, and we were all back at the truck, eating and talking, just having a pretty decent day in general. The crew I was with was a really great group of guys, and we all liked one another, which definitely made the jobs go by easier. After my decadent lunch of Vienna sausages, potato chips, and water, I grabbed a small gas can to refuel my saw, and a few tools for maintenance. I then started making my way back towards where I left off. Wait up! Wait up! My boss walked over, packing a saw. Hey, uh, I'll walk with you down there. I need to walk the boundary and make sure we went far enough. Yeah, sure. You just want to ruin my after-lunch nap, I said, jokingly. Oh, glad to know I'm not the only one that does that. Now I don't feel so lazy, he joked back. After another 15 minutes, we were back down the hill heading towards the grouping of trees where I'd left off. There we were, both met with quite the sight. On the ground, at the exact spot I left my saw, was nothing but several miscellaneous pieces of it. My boss rushed over to the spot to investigate. I was quick on his heels. He was cursing the whole way there. He could get very creative with his cursing when the occasion called for it. What kind of darned fool, he said, before he got quiet for a moment and looked at me. You were here. You saw where I left it when we walked away for lunch. You know it wasn't me, I said. I know, I know, he said, shaking his head. I just, I just don't understand why. Heck, just steal the dang thing. Why would they go through this trouble to destroy it? He sat there for a few more moments in disbelief before turning to talk to me again. Well, I guess now I gotta go get a hold of the cops. He turned back to look at the mess. Or whoever's gonna come all the way up here. Keep on cutting. Don't let this one out of your sight. My boss handed over his chainsaw to me. He then turned around and started to walk at a brisk pace back towards the truck. At this point, I was unnerved, to say the least. Between the feeling that came over me earlier, and now this vandalism of my chainsaw, I didn't exactly want to be out here by myself any longer. After a minute of once again getting my nerves under control, I grabbed all my supplies and I walked to the next area. I started to cut. Only about 150 yards away, I came across another small spot we'd missed, so I got back to it. For the next hour or so I worked, cutting up limbs and picking up broken branches off the ground stacking them into neat piles away from the trunks of any trees. My saw ran out of gas once again, and I put it down. 
At this point, the creeping dread started crawling up my spine again. The silence in that forest was deafening once the saw was shut down. I had acute awareness of every single tiny noise, or the lack thereof, and it made me shiver. I felt a presence all too close to me, and I froze in place. After building up my courage, I spun around to see still nothing. I sat down, fueling up the chainsaw. I wiped my face with a rag that I had in my back pocket. I'm losing it, I thought. But at the same time, the memory of the broken chainsaw seemed to linger, a reminder telling me that no, I was not losing it. There was something out here with me. I let out another heavy exhale and decided that I'd run one more fuel tank through my saw, and by that time it should be close enough to the end of the day that I can just head back to the truck. After readying my things, I looked around. I found this tiny dead pine, needles all yellowed and browned, sitting in a stand of three trees. To explain how these were standing, there were three aspen in a tiny grouping like a triangle. The dead pine was standing in the middle, at roughly four feet tall. There weren't any trees or debris for twenty feet around that grouping. I fired up the chainsaw again, and I went to work, cutting down the pine tree. A few moments later, it was cut in half, and the stump was cut flush to the ground. That should work, I thought. I walked backwards a few steps, so I could look at the bigger picture and see if there was anything else I needed to do. But then, I stopped dead in my tracks when my back pressed against something solid, and my body immediately went cold. I dashed forward, whipping around and holding the shut-down chainsaw between me and whatever had just snuck up behind me. My heart pounded, eyes wide. I examined the looming figure that stood over me. It was a giant, looming figure, imposing yet unnaturally skinny. My head only reached its waist, and its eyes were big, spinning with anger. Two large hands reached out to me, and the dimming light of the day, it looked like this thing had a set of wild horns sprouting out in all directions from its head. I yelped as I wheeled backwards. I stood there, paralyzed then, my brain starting to reconcile exactly what I was seeing. It was a tree, wasn't it? To be honest, as I gazed at the thing, even after I realized what it was, my brain couldn't figure out what I was seeing. Because it had bark, it seemed to be rooted in the earth, and its branches gently swayed in the wind. But there was a not-so-insignificant part of my mind that kept screaming, Run! For the love of God, run! I closed my eyes for a moment, breathing slowly, and I opened them again. I'm seeing things, I spoke aloud. That's it. It's been a long day and my nerves are shot. I took a step forward to inspect this dead tree. It indeed shared the shape of a humanoid figure even down to minor details. Its eyes that had been spinning in anger were two knots that were slightly different in diameter, spaced like they would be on a person. The mouth was a fist-sized hollowed-out hole that was just a black void in the fading light. The wild horns were branches, and two branches of the same size reached for me like long bony arms. The weirdest part of this was that it wasn't one trunk, it was two roots the size of skinny legs sprouting up from the ground and merged up at the middle of my chest. I'd seen trees like that before, but never any that merged that high above the ground. I stood there, trembling, trying to get my breathing under control. My mind kept switching rapidly between this being a monster or a simple malformed tree. I calmed down a bit after a few moments. I gave a nervous chuckle. It's just a tree. Calm down. I finally collected my nerves and said, You still got a job to do and this tree is dead. This is what you get for scaring me, you stupid tree. I ripped the pull cord on my chainsaw and it screamed to life. I took a step forward 
and right at the time I was maneuvering my saw to sink it deep into one of the tree's roots, I caught movement off to the left. Snapping my head in that direction, I saw my boss trudging through the woods and what I can assume were forest rangers following behind him. I pushed the kill switch on my saw, standing there taking a deep breath. Everything was out to scare me today, apparently. My boss waved me over to him. Hey, hey come walk with, come us. walk with us. Tell these guys Tell what guys happened to your chainsaw. your chainsaw. I did as I was told, walking with them to the spot our equipment had been destroyed. I packed my saw with me this time. They wrote down our names, numbers, heard our version of events, and they took pictures. Soon they were off to check some of the roads for any other vehicles that might be up there. They never did find anybody that did this. Well, it's getting late, said my boss. Go on and grab your fuel can and your tools. I'll pack your saw and meet you back at the truck. I nodded, and I went back to get my things, which I'd left near the group of Aspen. My unease was slowly creeping back, even though I'd made up my mind I was alright. I spotted the red fuel can in the distance, and right then, I stopped in my tracks. I immediately felt sick to my stomach. Where did the tree go? I said aloud, although I might as well had been whispering, because I could barely breathe. Once I forced my legs to work, I ran over and scooped up my tools and fuel can. I broke out into a dead sprint back to the truck, and I never looked behind me. After that day, our whole crew wasn't needed up there to finish up, so I never went back. I was very grateful for that. Pareidolia. That's the psychological effect of seeing faces and patterns and random objects. That was the explanation other people would propose when I shared my story with them. Others would tell me that maybe I should go get checked for schizophrenia. And maybe I should. But I feel it. In the recesses of my mind, I know what I saw, even though I try to forget. If I didn't try, I would never even be able to continue with my job. And maybe I am crazy. It was all in my head. But what I heard later would cement the fear into my mind. Months later, the Forest Service went up to that job site to have a controlled burn of the piles we'd made. A member of their crew disappeared. Some explain it away. He had just gotten lost, they'd say. But I've talked to people who are on that crew. The guy was not new. Everyone who knew him said that none of them could imagine that ever happening to him. The search for him ended suddenly too, and there was something really disturbing about the whole thing. Everyone agreed, especially me. I'm not sure why that thing took him and let me go. The only reason I can come up with is that when my boss and those rangers topped that hill, that thing saw them and froze. I'll probably never know why, but I know what I saw, and I know there's something out there in those woods. I Don't Go Into Attics Anymore From Neurotica Rampage Back in 1986, I was what people would call a rambler. As a kid in my early 20s with a thirst for adventure, I found myself moving around a lot. I'd spent my whole life in a small town and was chomping at the bit to actually go out and make something of myself. I think my parents were as well. My graduation present from my dad was a sandwich wrapped in a road map, so I think he was trying to tell me something. Anyway, I'd done quite a few different jobs in the last several years. A chef at a three-star resort? Done that. Built houses for the rich and famous out in California which, looking back on that now, I'm pretty positive was a money laundering scheme. Finally, I was a biohazardous disposal expert for a small county down in Texas. Or in layman's terms, I shoveled up roadkill. That was the last job I held before getting the job I had when this story took place. I had just arrived down in Arizona, and through some classified ads, I landed myself a job as an apprentice electrician. 
Honestly, I'm shocked, no pun intended, that I even got the job, because the interview felt like a train wreck. But I think my only saving grace was they were desperate for help. There for the first several months of the job, I wanted to quit every day. It seemed like I wasn't learning anything. None of my peers would take the time to show me, and I felt like the odd man out. I would do my best, but I think most of the crew wished the boss would have searched a bit harder for someone. Somebody with a bit more experience. Here they were, a group of seasoned electricians who had been doing it for a long time. Then you had me. A greenhorn, know-nothing, nomad that just blew in one day on a wind, lightly scented of alcohol. Over time, though, and with a lot, and I mean a lot of trial and error, I was finally getting to the point where I was becoming capable at the job. At least, it seemed like it to me. The day this story began was a day like any other. Well, it was a little different. I was actually having a good day, which was rare, but it did happen. We were doing a rough-in in a new suburb that was being developed on the outskirts of the city, and we were making excellent time. We'd already done all four home runs and ran the circuits, so I was just making up boxes at the time. And for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, a rough-in means that after the house is framed, we would come in, run wire, and nail up boxes where the outlets, switches, and lights would go. A home run is the first wire running from the breaker box to the circuit in the different sections of the house, and making up boxes just refers to prepping the wires for the next step of the process. So as I said, I was making up boxes, having a somewhat decent day when one of the journeymen came up to talk to me. Hey man, finish up what you're doing and come with me. I guess some old woman called and wants us to come check some things out for her. You know what those things might be? I asked. Not positive what it is exactly. The boss didn't say. I nodded and finished up what I was doing, then put my tools away inside my bag, which was actually a school backpack, because I couldn't afford a tool bag at the time. We then walked out to the work truck. As we drove to the customer's house, I became more disheartened. We were leaving the part of the city that had been subject to a lot of new development and began to enter the older part of town. Oh no, please don't tell me we gotta go work on an old house. I was having such a good day. Afraid so, the journeyman said flatly, and I let out a frustrated sigh. Old houses in the area were an absolute nightmare to work on. For starters, back when a lot of them were built, it was the homeowner themselves building it, so there was likely no rhyme or reason to how it was wired. The mindset of the day was, as long as it works. If professionals had been hired, their methods could best be described as fast and loose, or sometimes even a company secret, because the codes had not been seriously enforced at the city's inception of power lines. It was the Wild West of electrical, basically. Then you actually had to get to the spot where the work was required, which usually consisted of a cellar or crawl space that had not seen the light of day for 50 years and were infested with spiders that could pack you off, or attics which were cramped, hotter than Satan's six-pack, and likely insulated with asbestos. Oh yeah, and those spiders lived up there too. We arrived at the house mid-afternoon, parked out front, then got out, making our way towards the door. It was an old house, all right. Real old. Two stories tall, but if I had to guess, there was a cellar and attic in there too. Lots of places to find myself lodged in. Taped to the door was a note that read, Electricians, I can't hear very well. Just walk in and I'll be in the living room. The journeyman grabbed the note, gave two knocks out of courtesy or maybe habit, and opened the door. The inside of the house was dark and broken down, with an odor emanating and penetrating on top of everything else I noticed. If I had to take a guess, it was a mix of dust cat urine, dead mice, and food that had been left out. If nothing else, my biohazardous disposal expertise had somewhat prepared me for this. But the journeyman looked a sickly shade of green, even in the dull light. In the main hall, there were stairs, which led up to the second floor, and several doorways shooting off into several directions. To our left, we saw what appeared to be the living room, 
and hesitantly, we walked inside. In the middle of the far wall was a TV playing reruns of some black and white show from the 50s. And as we peered back a little bit, we saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair, eyes locked on the screen with an afghan laid across her lap. She didn't even register that we were there until we were standing right next to her. The journeyman spoke up finally, in a louder voice than what he would normally use. Miss Durham, we are here to fix your electrical. Huh? Ah, oh, yes. Good. It's about time. We lost power to the bathroom and spare room upstairs. She breathed raggedly. A rat probably chewed through a wire. I can hear the little nuisances causing a ruckus at all hours of the day. My son said we didn't need to hire anyone and he'd fix it, but I feel like if I didn't call you fellas, I wouldn't live to see it ever get done. We'll get it figured out for you, Miss Durham, the journeyman said. See that you do. The electrical box is in the basement. My son isn't here, so if you have any more questions, you're gonna have to figure it out on your own until he gets back. We can handle it he said assuredly. After a brief talking over the plan, we got to work. Our first goal was to isolate the circuit, find where the power stopped flowing, then hunt down all the exposed wire that related to said circuit in accessible areas, looking for damage and testing as we did. Failing that, we would start on more intrusive methods. We'd hoped to ask the sun if any of the electrical had been changed at all recently, but that would have to wait until he returned. After some troubleshooting, the journeyman decided he was going to check out the basement, where we were told the breaker box was located, which left me to go take a peek in the attic. Lucky me. The house sounded like it was going to fall apart as the stairs squeaked and cracked when I ascended them. When I got to the top, I looked down the halls going left and right, inspecting the ceiling. Bingo. To the right on the ceiling at the end of the hall, there was something different. A ring was embedded into it, along with a sliding latch. I approached it and then looked around for something to open it. In a few moments of looking around, I'd found a pole with a hook on the end, standing up in the corner of a storage closet that was close by. With this, I was able to slide the latch and pull on the ring. The door swung down, and at the top was a sliding ladder. I grabbed the bottom rung with the hook and pulled, extending it down. It was pitch black up there, so I took my pack off my back, produced a flashlight, took a deep breath, and climbed the ladder. The second I climbed the ladder and reached the other side, it hit me. A god-awful smell that almost sent me gagging. I raised the collar of my shirt to act as a makeshift filter and shone the flashlight around. There were boxes stacked to the ceiling all around me, and a thick dust floated through the flashlight's beam. Above me was a light with a pull chain dangling down, but when I reached up and pulled it, nothing happened. Of course, the attic is tied to the bathroom. Why wouldn't it be? I grumbled. There was definitely something dead up here, but nothing like I'd ever smelled before. I reasoned myself to continue on, because it wasn't the first time I'd climbed into the same attic an animal had before it met its untimely demise. But this was way different than the other times. The boxes were stacked in such a way that they created a path forward, and I cautiously followed it. I kept my light on the floor to make sure I didn't trip over the stuff littered all over the place. On the other side of the boxes, the path opened up, and I stepped forward looking for any wires that I might be able to find running along the floor or the bottom corners of the pitched roof. Taking a few more steps, I halted when my light lit up a blue tarp that had been laid over a large section of the floor. At least, the outer edges were blue anyway. Most of its center had turned a dark brown by now. It might have been my naivete that kept trying to mentally hand wave away what was right in front of me, or maybe even the feeling that most kids have that nothing bad can ever actually happen to them. I look back at this moment and wish a lot of things had been different. But really, given where I found myself standing at that place in time, I don't think anything would have made what happened next any less horrific. As I took a step forward, towards the center of the tarp, 
my light still trained in the brown stain. I ran headfirst into something weighty. In surprise, I wheeled backwards and brought my light beam up. Immediately, my stomach dropped and all the breath in my lungs dissipated. There, illuminated by the faint halo of the flashlight, hung a body. Time stood still around me as I gazed upon this nightmare, and every detail was burned into my memory. The rotting corpse hung by a rope from the rafters, its neck being gradually pulled apart by the combined weight of the flayed torso and limbs. Its clothes were missing, but the person had been so badly mutilated beyond recognition that there wasn't even a way to tell if it had been man or woman, or if they had been young or old. However, they still had shoes on. To this day, I wonder why. After what seemed like an eternity, reality finally hit me, and I started to throw up where I stood on the tarp. I felt dizzy, my world spun, but I had to get out of there. As I turned and made a few labored steps toward the hatch, I heard a noise at the far end of the attic. I spun around, shining the light at the noise, and even though my eyes had started to well up with tears, I could still make things out. In the corner was a pile of random junk with blankets lying on top. Underneath the blankets peeked a set of eyes, sunken into a small ghost-white face. The figure spoke to me, whispered to me, but in that moment I couldn't comprehend it. It felt like I was having a mental overload, and everything sounded underwater. I started to hyperventilate, and that's when I finally couldn't hold it back anymore. I screamed. I bolted back towards the hatch, barely keeping myself upright, as I shot back through the entrance of the attic. Three rungs down, my shaking legs failed me, and I lost my footing. Falling to the bottom, my foot got hung up in one of the rungs putting me upside down, and I slammed hard on my shoulder. For the moment, I was stunned, but I'd entered a state of adrenaline-fueled hysteria, and I never quit screaming. Fear had overtaken me, but lying on the floor gave me a brief moment where I actually contemplated the gravity of what I'd seen, and even though a painful realization had dawned on me only in that moment, I'd already committed to my action. I had to get help. Whoever had done those things might have been there in the house with us, and I just stumbled upon their secret. When I could stand once again, I hurried down the stairs, sounding like I was going to bring the house down in the process. The journeyman came up through the basement door in a panic, yelling in confusion to me, but that just spurred me on faster, and to doing so, I almost fell down the other half of the stairs. If not for me being quick to catch the banister, I likely would have. I think at this point, I remember yelling to the journeyman that we had to get out, that we had to call the police, but I'm not sure. As I got to the bottom and was almost to the door, a middle-aged man appeared from the living room and grabbed me by my shoulders. Whoa there, slow down buddy, what's going on? At that point, no one was going to stop me from getting out of this place. With all my might, I pushed him into the wall with a crash, flung open the door, and ran outside. After that, things become blurry, but I'll do my best to remember. When the journeyman caught up to me, I was pounding on the neighbor's door, begging for someone to answer, and that I needed to call the police. Most of what I said was nonsensical, but after a few moments, he got the gist of it. I could tell he couldn't really process it, though. It took some time for anyone to answer my stark raving and mad yelling, and when they finally did, we were able to use their phone. After getting a hold of dispatch, the journeyman called our boss as well. Our boss actually showed up before the police. Go figure. After what felt like forever, the cops finally showed up and I told them my story. I finished and they marched over to Miss Durham's home, where they knocked on the door. It opened, revealing the man that had stopped me when I was trying to get out. He was apparently Miss Durham's son, and he had walked in only a few minutes before I came back downstairs. After talking with him a few moments, the cops asked if they could search the home, 
They told him this could easily be considered an exigent circumstance, but his cooperation would be greatly appreciated. Without hesitation, he let them in and led them into the attic. When the cops exited the house, they were yelling apologies to Miss Durham and spoke the same to her son. They then turned around to walk our way. Behind them, the son slowly closed the door, staring directly at me as he did so. The cops didn't find a single thing, nada, nothing, zilch. There was no body, no tarp. There was no pile of blankets with eyes peeking out. I pleaded with them, but they assured me their search had been thorough. After they left, I was told to hop in the boss's truck and we then went back to the main office. I was then promptly fired. The boss told me I got off lucky, actually. The son wasn't pressing charges against me for shoving him into the wall or suing the company. And that was that. In the following months, I couldn't let go of what I saw. I ended up parking down the block from Miss Durham's house and watching them for hours, several days a week, but I never saw anything. The son, however, did catch me sitting there once, but he just waved. And after that, I didn't go back anymore. I was just going to get in trouble if I did. It's been a long time since that happened. I'm far, far away from that place now, but it never really goes away. God, how I wish it did. I know at points in this retelling of the story, I've tried my best to inject a little levity. Because if I didn't, I think I'd fall apart. Honestly, I didn't even want to tell it. But I've got to find a way to come to terms with it somehow, right? Those moments have taken on more clarity in hindsight, and I dream about it, causing me sometimes to wake up in the night, sometimes even crying. My wife knows about these dreams, and she does her best to console me. For the longest time, I pushed the intrusive thoughts away, but that doesn't change the reality. I was just a kid, but I was still a coward. And those dreams are always the same. The corpse still hangs there, those eyes under the blanket still stare at me. As my own tear-filled eyes come into focus and the oceans in my ears part for but a moment. And in that moment I hear a tiny voice beg, Please help me. I'm so sorry, whoever you were. I'd give anything to help you now. Fragile Therapy from Valentina After hearing so many chilling stories, I felt it was time to share a haunting memory from my younger years. The year was 1983, a time when the vast terrain of the USSR sprawled over Eastern Europe and Northern Asia. I found myself in Karelia, a breathtaking region of Russia known for its dense forests, intricate lakes, and chilling northern winds. Karelia during the 80s was a different world. The land was as rugged as the people, and the remnants of the Great War were still visible, not in buildings or streets, but in the eyes of its citizens. I worked as a nurse in a psychiatry facility, located on the outskirts of a small town. The building, though stern and imposing, was surrounded by the calm beauty of nature, an ironic setting for those whose minds were in turmoil. Here we treated a wide number of cases, from mild depressions to severe psychotic episodes. The facility had a separate wing for patients who were considered dangerous, either to themselves or to others. Life was routine, with its fair share of challenges, of course, but there was one patient in that isolated wing that everyone was cautious of, Mikhail. In his mid-thirties, Mikhail had a history of violent outbursts. Records showed he'd once been a teacher, a beloved figure in his community, before something snapped after a traumatic event that happened while he was on a school trip with his students. Two of his students were tragically lost in a sudden storm. He never forgave himself. The overwhelming guilt, combined with the grief of the town which once loved and respected him, became too much to bear. His mental health deteriorated rapidly, leading to outbursts of anger, severe depressive episodes, and eventually, 
his commitment to the psychiatric facility. His deep-set eyes always seemed to be studying you, calculating, as if deciding whether you were a threat or an opportunity. One evening as a winter storm raged outside, I was assigned to the isolation ward due to a shortage of staff. With a heavy sigh and a prayer, I started my rounds, eventually coming to Mikhail's room. The room was dimly lit, with a single bulb flickering overhead. As I entered, Mikhail sat on his bed, eyes fixated on a small window that overlooked the snow-covered courtyard. Not wanting to startle him, I softly called out, Mikhail, it's time for your medication. No response. As I approached, I could hear him muttering under his breath. The words weren't clear, but it was evident he was agitated. Trying to remain calm, I gently placed my hand on his shoulder. That turned out to be a big mistake. In a flash, he grabbed my wrist with one hand and my neck with the other, his grip like iron. I could feel his cold breath on my face as he whispered something incomprehensible, his eyes wide and wild. Panic surged through me, and in that moment, I realized just how vulnerable I was. I tried to speak, tried to soothe him, but words failed me. All I could think was, what if he decided to hurt me, or worse? What if no one heard me scream over the roaring storm outside? The seconds felt like hours, but it was probably just a minute or two before orderlies finally rushed into the room, having heard the commotion. They managed to restrain Mikhail and administer a sedative. In the meantime, I was escorted out, shaken but unharmed. Sitting in the break room, I realized that while Mikhail didn't harm me, the terror of what could have happened would stay with me. After that distressing evening, I requested not to be assigned to the isolation ward again. The head nurse granted this request, but Mikhail's unpredictable presence was always felt, his room casting a dark shadow that permeated the facility. As co-workers told me, more outbursts followed in the weeks ahead. Some time went by, and the incident started to fade from the forefront of my mind. That is, until one day, when there was a rumor in the facility. A rumor that Mikhail had crafted an intricate drawing on the walls of his room. Curiosity overcame my apprehension, so I decided to take a peek for myself. The drawing was real and bewildering. It was a detailed depiction of the facility itself, but with certain rooms highlighted, others crossed out. Right at the corner of his sketch, away from the main building, was a small depiction of a shed, a shed that was a real storage area for the hospital. It was then I remembered a rumor that during the war, the shed had been used for unauthorized, clandestine experiments on patients. So, how did Mikhail know about this? Was there a connection between his current state and that old forsaken shed? Late one evening after my shift, curiosity compelled me to venture towards that shed. The snow crunched beneath my feet, the full moon casting shadows. Pushing the door open, I was met with an unexpected sight. A makeshift classroom setup. Old wooden desks, a chalkboard, and scattered papers. In front, on the other side of the room, on a wall, I could see photos. There were pictures of patients sitting in the classroom. Right in the middle of it all was a photo. A photo of younger Mikhail, surrounded by younger patients, presumably his students. A realization struck me. This wasn't just a storage shed. At some point, it had been Mikhail's sanctuary a place where he taught and interacted with young people away from the world. But why here in the confines of the psychiatric facility? Before I could wonder further, a soft voice echoed from the doorway. A place full of memories, isn't it? I turned swiftly to see Irina, a co-worker from another ward who had been at the facility far longer than I had. She walked over, her fingers lightly touching the photo. This was Mikhail's class. He used to teach here as part of a therapy program. The facility believed that letting him connect with his past, under supervision, 
might help him heal. I was taken aback. Why here in this old shed? Irina sighed. It was isolated, away from the main facility. The thought was it would be less intimidating for him. But perhaps it was a mistake. Being here so close to the past, yet confined within the boundaries of the institution, it might have just made things worse. She looked around, sadness evident in her eyes. Sometimes trying to reconnect someone with their past can be a double-edged sword. For Mikhail, it seems to have cut deeper than anyone realized. With that in mind, I went home. I've never forgotten that night, and it just reminds me how fragile humans can be and that things are not always in our hands. Take care, everyone. Unexplained Creatures in the Middle East From Anonymous Mar Desma. It's a monster that feeds on one thing. Fear. I'm very happy to say that I personally have had no encounters with it, but the stories that you might hear about it are usually told by people who are not liars. Allow me to explain what it is, first with some history. I live in Iran, specifically the province of eastern Azerbaijan. If you look up what is called the Iranian Plateau, or the Iranian Cultural Continent, or Greater Iran, you'll find Iran and a bunch of her neighboring countries. In this area, different branches of Iranian languages are spoken, and with similar cultures comes similar mythology, and with that comes shared monsters. Originally, we believed in monsters called Deves. They are creations of Ahriman, the devil. Deves are a mortal enemy to the human race, like demons in Western culture. Imagine ghouls with the strength to lift a mountain, with claws and teeth like daggers, and impenetrable skin. If that's not overpowered enough, they're also said to be very smart, capable of using black magic to do things like taking different forms. There are famous Deves, such as Cheshmuk, who is responsible for earthquakes and hurricanes. Some appear in Shah Nameh, the Book of Ancient Iranian Legends, such as the White Div, who imprisoned the Shah of Iran and was defeated by a warrior from Sistan. After the Muslim conquest and conversion to Islam, people kept their culture, but the Divs were now called by an Islamic name, Jinn. Mar Desma is a Div. Of course, that means some might call it Jinn. The word Mar Dasma in Persian and other Iranian languages means man-tester, or man-challenger. It may be pronounced a bit differently in various parts. Mar Desma, Mart Asma, some might call it Javan Asma, meaning young tester or even jinn, but they all refer to the same thing, a div which can take different forms, even the forms of your loved ones. It can mimic the sounds of your loved ones and do anything it can to draw you into graveyards or forests or dark alleys and dark corners at night. When it takes the form of an animal or human, it looks completely natural. It feeds on fear and, oddly enough, never attacks timid people. It likes to scare brave souls. That's why it is called Challenger. Mar Dosma uses various ways and tactics. Sometimes it takes the forms of innocent-looking farm animals, such as sheep, goats, or dogs, and approaches lone people in the dark. Then it suddenly speaks or changes forms. Sometimes it might approach a lonely traveler or stranger. Sometimes you hear someone that you know calling you, trying to draw you into the woods or dark caves or something of the sort. If you go in, though, it will scare you to death. You might have a heart attack, so yeah, it can kill people. There are times it might appear as a thin and skinny looking creature, but as you want to investigate what it is exactly, it will start to rapidly grow taller and taller into a gigantic monster right from your nightmares. Maybe one night you're getting home late. A head comes out of a dark corner. Maybe the face looks like your neighbor, but as you want to say hello, 
the face begins to change. The more you look, the uglier and scarier it becomes, until either you look away and run or continue watching the show and die of sheer terror. The Challenger always invents new ways to scare people, and usually it doesn't want to kill you, it just wants you to be scared. But there is one thing that will make it angry, so angry, in fact, that it will not hesitate to tear you apart. Never tell Mar does Ma that you are not scared of it. Never challenge the Challenger. Some believe that if you become friends with a Mar does Ma, it can tell you the places of lost objects, or give you life advice, or tell you something from the future. But I wouldn't risk it. My apologies for the long introduction. Just keep in mind that Mar does Ma only challenges the brave. So if you're a scaredy cat like me, there is no need to worry. Here are the stories. The first two I heard from people that I trust, and the last one is a famous story told around here. So take it with a grain of salt. Number one, the floating man. This story is from an old man in my village in Eastern Azerbaijan, Iran. Our main product is apples. It happened in a trail around our village. During the day, it's gorgeous, but at night, it can be a very scary place. I will share the story from his point of view. I was younger, you see. Our watering schedule at the apple farm was set up so that each garden would have a few hours of water. My shift at the gardens began in the middle of the night, so I would have to wake up, pick up my shovel, then go to the gardens to water the apple trees. It was an hour-long walk, and it went right through the graveyard, then along through other people's gardens. I know what you're thinking, but no, it didn't happen in the graveyard. The night in question, I was able to pass through the graveyard without any trouble. I then entered the part of the path that was surrounded by trees. These trees formed a thick wall along the shoulders of the road. Here, all you can see are the stars above and the road lit by the moonlight below you. I soon arrived at the spot where there are some big rocks on the ground. I was looking down to watch my steps so that I didn't trip over one. It was then that I felt a presence above me. It was like I felt a shadow of fear lay over me. Hesitantly, I looked up. Between two of the trees, I saw this tall man floating above me. He had his hands completely open. Imagine someone floating in a pool with their front side and face in the water. And imagine you're under the water below them, sitting at the bottom, and they're staring right at you. That's what it was like. I was terrified when I saw his face. His eyes were big and wide open, almost popping out of their sockets. And his teeth. I wasn't sure if he was smiling or baring his teeth at me, or if he just didn't have lips at all. But I knew those teeth did not look natural for a human. I whimpered, What are you? And it spoke to me. I. But I didn't really want to stay there and hear what else it had to say. I quickly dropped my shovel and began to run with all the power I could summon in my legs. I'm not sure if it followed me or not, because I never did look back. I stopped only when I was back in the village on my doorstep. Even in the morning, I didn't dare go retrieve my shovel. I'm not sure what it was, and I was not going to stay there to hear the answer to my question. Number two, the sheep. This story was told to me by a friend of mine. It happened to his great uncle in their village in Luristan. This story will be told from his point of view. I was in my twenties. One late, dark evening, I was on my way home casually passing through the empty alleys when I saw this sheep at a small dead end. It was too late for sheep to be outside, unaccompanied and awake, so I thought it was a runaway. As I was watching it, I got a clearer look at it. It was a beautiful and healthy sheep, 
It looked to be a good breed, and I was very tempted to take it home myself. I was young and strong, so I just lifted it up and put it on my shoulders, and I kept walking. After a couple of steps, I remembered to check if it was a male or female, so I felt over between its legs. Now, as I'm just about to find out, the sheep brings its mouth closer to my left ear, and I hear it speak to me. You know, I'm way older than your grandfather. Freaking out, I dropped the sheep, but when I looked back, it disappeared. It had just vanished like it was never there. When I arrived home, I told the story to my family, who said it was probably a djinn. Number three, the story of Palavan Abbas. Palavan Abbas was a man in a small village named Tarmistan in Zagros Mountains. Palavan means champion because he was a wrestler and Abbas was his name. Aside from wrestling, his main occupation was pottery. He had a student named Kasim who was going to learn his art. Kasim's father had passed away and he lived with his old mother. So Palavan Abbas had told Kasim that if there was any problem, he could ask him for help. One night, there was a knocking at Palavan's door. It was Kasim saying, Please hurry, Palavan. My mother is sick and I need your help to get her to a doctor. Now, Kasim seemed to be speaking with a different tone and accent than usual. But Palavan immediately got dressed and told Kasim to lead the way. After a while, it became clear that they were not on the right path to Kasim's house. Kasim was leading him outside of town. Kasim, where are we going? Asked Palavan. Kasim just turned and smiled at him with yellow teeth. Weird, he thought. They climbed a hill and Kasim said, We're here. So where's your mom, Kasim? As Kasim turned, Palavan saw that it wasn't Kasim at all. What he was now looking at was a hideous, three meter high creature with a humanoid body and the face of a dog. What are you? said Palavan. The creature replied, I am Mardosma. Are you scared? No. A champion fears nothing, replied Palavan. Well, then you must wrestle with me. If you lose, I will take your life, said the creature. And so they wrestled, fighting for hours. And near the morning, Palavan managed to win. As the monster's back touched the ground, it turned into dust and smoke. With many bruises and a lot of pain, Palavan went back to the village, to the real Kasim, where he told the others what had happened to him before dying from exhaustion. This is an update to the original set of stories about Mar Dasma. Since writing that previous post, I spoke to a distant cousin of mine who recalled an adventure we had as kids, something I had forgotten about. Although this is technically one story, I think it would be best to break it into two. Number four, behind the window. I was staying at my parents' house. They told me I could sleep in the room upstairs. That room was pretty big. It had a lot of stuff and junk in it, kind of like the old attics in movies. There was a window in there, maybe about two meters by two meters with thick curtains, and right under it was my bed. From the very start, I got a bad feeling about that window, but I just shrugged it off. At about 9 p.m., it started. Bang! It was like a muscular man had punched the glass as hard as he could. It was even more terrifying because I couldn't see outside. The curtains were too thick. Quickly, I ran downstairs in a panic, telling my grandmother, Oh, don't worry. We didn't hear anything. It probably was just some bird or bat attracted to the light of your room. 
Just turn the light off and go to bed, honey. So I did. Around midnight, though, I was awakened by, you guessed it, another bang. This time I was in the bed, so it was only inches from my face. I tried to calm myself down, to go back to sleep, but around 3 a.m. it came again, this time much harder. It felt as if something was hiding on the other side of that window, just about to break through and take me away. I couldn't see anything, and I was way too scared to open the curtain and peek outside. The pure silence was killing me now, not a single cricket or dog barking. Slowly, I crawled out of bed, quietly making my way downstairs to my grandparents. All the while, I felt hunted by something. Once I got down there, I just slept on a blanket on the floor. It wasn't comfy at all, but at least it felt safe. The following night, I tried once again to sleep in that very same room in the very same bed. But the large window with the thick curtains never did have that haunting feeling again. I would even go on to sleep there many times throughout the years, and I never had any more supposed bats or birds banging on the window. Nowadays, I think it may have been Ma Desma trying to scare me. I don't think bats would all of a sudden feel like going kamikaze on me like that. Number 5. The Brog this always gave me the goosebumps. Back when we were kids, Kay, my cousin, and I would play together, going on adventures, discovering things, and so on. One summer, we were entrusted with the responsibility to herd a dozen cattle. We would gather them in the morning, take them out into the fields, start a fire, and cook lunch as they ate. We would take them then to a river, or somewhere with water, to drink. Then we would take them back to the village in the evening. Now keep in mind, this happened in the exact same trail as the story, The Floating Man, that I told before. The night before, we had read a made-up story, a creepypasta, if you will, about a monster called Brog, who haunted a road in another country. I've forgotten which country that was. Now, we knew it wasn't real, and even if it was, it was in some other part of the world and could never get us. In this story, the brog kind of looked like a werewolf. It was said that he would first feel hunted or stalked, then suddenly all the birds in the area would flee away. You would then begin to hear footsteps behind you, and they would get closer as if they are walking inches behind you. Then you would hear the breathing. Not long after that, you would hear a massive, terrifying roar. By the time you turned around to see your stalker, you would see nothing more than a pair of red eyes, and the following morning, they would find your cold, dead body. Your skin turned black as coal, and that was when we got too spooked to read the rest. The next morning, we decided to make our way through, you guessed it, the trail. In the morning, it was truly beautiful. As the evening approached, it took a bit longer than we liked to gather our things and the cows. In the dark, we were walking along the trail with the cows in front of us. Now, at the time, we had not heard the story of the floating man, so we weren't scared at all of the trail ahead. But that was about to change. One by one, the signs of Brog started to come to life for us. First, that sudden and ominous feeling of being stalked. Second, the birds all around the valley suddenly getting spooked all at once and flying away. Third, the footsteps getting closer and closer to us. We tried to walk, not run, faster and faster. Suddenly, the bushes behind us began to make noises as if something was running through them and shaking them. I said to my cousin, Hey, why don't you take a look to see what's behind us? Dude, I I'm as scared as you are. I I'm not looking back, he said. We were sure that this was it, that we wouldn't see the light of tomorrow. But as we made it to the graveyard, 
suddenly things changed, as if something heavy was lifted from our hearts. We found the courage to look back. What was following us was just a dog, and it just turned back and ran into the wilderness. Later that night, we decided to read the rest of the Brog story. A certain part made our hearts churn in our chest. Brog can show itself as a dog. All these years later, I would shrug off the Brog adventure as us being kids, but now I think that something knew exactly and specifically what we were scared of, then presented itself in that way. There are other stories about that trail. I once heard someone say they saw something that would be best described as a mix between Yoda from Star Wars and a monkey along that same trail at night. I found a big similarity in all of them. The graveyard is safe, and the Mar Dosma will not follow you there. My cousin believes that may be because there are good people buried there. What lives on the island? From Country Dweller 05 Before I begin, I feel I should clarify some things about myself. I am a skeptic, even after these events, and whilst my family are devoutly Catholic, I am by no means religious, as I've always had that see-it-to-believe-it mindset. Bearing this in mind, the event of this story has completely changed my outlook on topics such as life, death, and religion, and now I'm unsure how to fully process things. I'd hoped that by sharing this, I might get some insight, or perhaps relief, from speaking about it. As a warning, the following story mentions brief injury to animals and people. Growing up in Ireland, there are many places worthy of exploration and rich histories, as well as beautiful views. As I've gotten older, friends have often come with me to explore these places. The typical group I go with involves my boyfriend, A and three of our friends, J, M, and H. At 10.30 p.m., we met up at the local McDonald's car park, each of us decked out in hiking boots, combat trousers, heavy coats, hats, gloves, and torches. We took our exploration trip seriously, having encountered our fair share of antisocial groups, and, on one occasion, a very angry pigeon that resulted in the small scar above my eyebrow. In our naive minds, we were more than prepared for the night ahead, leaving little room for things to go wrong. We'd all crammed ourselves into my boyfriend's Land Rover, setting off towards our location of the night. That was an 11th century monastic site, hidden out in the countryside on a small island in the middle of a lake, reached only by an old rickety bridge. Eventually, one hour, five wrong turns, and a loose sheep later, we came to the bridge that led to the ruins. When I call it a bridge, it was, in reality, little more than rotting planks of wood thrown together to create a 20-meter or 65-foot long walkway that stretched across the shallow lake to the small piece of land home to the monastery. On the other side, we were met with the shrouded tree line that sheltered our destination, and turning to look back over the bridge, we could no longer see my boyfriend's four-wheeler due to the thick mist that had fallen upon the surrounding area. Despite what you might think, none of us found the area creepy or sensed anything dangerous, not even when we arrived at the actual ruins. For the first two hours after our arrival, nothing out of the ordinary happened. We all spread out over the place, seeing it for ourselves and finding some cool stuff. Things were going smoothly until about 2 a.m., because that's when M began screaming hysterically from the other side of the island. This side of the island was bare of trees or ruins, and was nothing more than extremely arid soil, so we'd found it odd that M would be over here at all. Running over, we saw her sitting on the ground, pointing wildly to a pile of rocks that I'd missed on my first inspection of the area. Upon further study, however, it became apparent it was not a pile of rocks. Rather, it was a pile of small, but very dead, animals. The smallest of these animals was a little mouse, and the largest, a fox. These animals had very clearly experienced gruesome deaths, 
with eyes gouged out, lacerations along their abdomens, limbs torn off and added neatly to the pile. It's important to note that there are no large predators in Ireland capable of doing something like this. Those dead creatures stink, but I found it very hard to look away from them, and I stared on, confused. We asked him if she had seen anything else, but she was adamant that she had been wanting to take a second look in case she found anything out here, and instead found these animals. Nothing else had caught her attention, apparently. Nothing else had seemed odd. All of us were admittedly a little shaken and creeped out. I felt a nauseous sensation pulling in my chest. When 4 a.m. came, we had finished up and we were preparing to leave the area. The events of two hours ago had been pushed to the backs of our minds and we were laughing freely at whatever stupid tales H was recounting. Until, at least, we all at once picked up on the dead silence of the surrounding area. I mean, there wasn't even a breath of wind or a ripple of water against the shoreline only 10 meters away from us. The tree line was mute. This was unlike any lack of sound anyone in our group had ever felt, and right away, we had feelings of unease and panic. We froze up, before eventually turning back to the tree line and staring in fear. J, H, and I had pulled out our pocket knives we were all shining our torches carefully along the dark line of vegetation, searching for any movement. It was this very moment that my life changed. I saw what was upon first glance only a shadow, but shining my torchlight over to it, it was very clearly the figure of a very tall, very lanky man. He must have been around six foot seven, and he stood with a hunch. But what scared me the most was his skin. He was covered in lacerations, and even charred in places, rotting away from his very own bones. He was missing his left arm, and his lips had seemingly rotted off to reveal a gaping hole of a mouth. This man had no eyes, only torn flesh around his sockets, suggesting they had been carved out, just like those animals. The drive back to the McDonald's car park was silent, and no one spoke a word of goodbye to one another as we parted ways. A drove me home, and when he pulled up outside my house, he grabbed my hand. Look, I don't know what you think you saw back there, but I swear, we didn't see anything. We were all hyped up and a little bit freaked out. It could have been a trick of the torchlight. Just get some rest. I'll see you tomorrow, he told me, kissing me gently on the head. I believed him. He was probably right, after all, so I decided not to think on it anymore. Until last week, I had a dream about the island. Three nights ago before writing this, I made A take me back. We arrived at the other side of the bridge at 8.15 p.m., I didn't see anything. Deciding that wasn't enough, though, I continued on to the ruins, despite A pleading for me to leave. The second I got to the monastery, a wave of a scent of rotting flesh hit my senses, and it took all my strength not to empty my stomach there and then. I forced myself to look around, and at first I saw nothing. But as I turned back to leave, I saw, out of the corner of my eye, a tall figure standing by the collapsed stone. I don't think I could have even faced it more than that. Ignorance is bliss, right? I regret going back to that place. For your information, I don't take any types of drugs or medications. I'm not prone to mental episodes, and both times I was very much aware of my surroundings. And I will tell you, what was there felt very real. Despite this, every part of me wants to believe it was a figment of my imagination to just move on from the experience, but I can't. I refuse to call it a ghost, as M jokingly called it, nor a spirit or demon. I don't know what it was, but it felt like death itself had shown its face to me, 
I haven't been able to sleep the past three nights, and I've barely eaten. I don't know how to process all this. If anyone at all could offer me some advice or insight, I would really appreciate it. When the Ground Shakes From Yosemite Sam My wife wanted me to share this story with you. She listens to the podcast and thought I should let people know what a true, real-life, scary story was like. When I was a kid of about 12 years old, I used to live in a small town just outside Johnson City, Tennessee. That's deep in the Appalachian Mountains. This was back in the 70s, and people were different about their kids then. We would go off all day and not come home till dark. People didn't worry about the same kinds of things we do now, but perhaps we should have. We would explore the woods, find abandoned mines and caves, and camp outside on warm summer nights. We weren't stuck in front of the TV, like kids today. Back then, you could only get two or three channels in the mountains, so it was pretty boring to just stay home. In retrospect, we did some pretty dumb things and took some insane risks that could have cost us our lives. But somehow, we survived it all. The story starts early one morning when I and my brothers and sisters were waiting on the school bus. It was around 7 a.m. on a cold November morning. This would have been in 1973 or 1974. We noticed the gravel on the road moving. We heard the sound of rocks falling and we could see dirt and dust rising from a nearby ridge. This continued for about 10 seconds and was enough to make us run back into the house. The radio in my dad's old car said there was a 7.3 magnitude earthquake in Claiborne County to our north. I remember my dad saying it was felt all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, some 100 miles south from there. We ended up missing school that day, which was pretty cool for us. So we took off, like we usually did, into the woods by that ridge because we wanted to see which rocks had fallen. On our way to the ridge, we saw a place where the ground had opened up, revealing a cave entrance. Now, real cave entrances, which aren't cleared for tourists, look a lot different than the ones in movies or pictures. This was covered with roots and leaves and dirt, but you could see inside it pretty well. We went back to the house, getting some rope and my dad's old lantern. Before long, we were back at the new cave with these supplies, gathering up our courage to go in. We talked about finding gold or diamonds, maybe turning it into a secret hideout. There were four of us, including two twin boys, my best friend Dale and me. Dale and I were best friends. We were inseparable for the most part. The twin boys were always getting into trouble, and they used profanity a lot but they were always trying to outdo each other, so they were fun to hang around with. We climbed down the embankment to the mouth of the cave, and we turned on the lantern. Dale pulled away roots and leaves to make the cave mouth big enough to climb through. I stuck my head inside and was immediately met with the smell of death. The air was so thick with the smell of it, I gagged. Not to be discouraged, I pulled my t-shirt up over my nose, and pushed past the roots until I was inside. Dale handed me the light, and inside I saw a low, flat room about four feet high and easily twenty feet across. The cave went further back, but my light couldn't make out any details past that. Dale crawled through next, then the twins. Holding the lantern as high as I could, we proceeded into the cave. Once we were inside, we could see bones of animals all over the floor. Some of them had been picked clean. Others still had meat on them. Then one of the twins found a dog collar on one of them. So it told us these were the bones of cats, dogs, sheep, deer, and small rodents. The bones were scattered around the floor, as if they'd been tossed away from the carcass in many cases. I remember thinking what could have done this when I noticed two lights reflecting the lamp in the back of the cave. It didn't make a noise. I remember saying, Guys, we need to get out of here now. 
I never took my eyes off the two pinpoints of light. It must have been something in my voice, because Dale perked up and followed my gaze. Without another word, we all got out of the cave as fast as we could. There was only one thing it could be, a bear's din. Once outside, we all ran way back to the house and told our dad what we saw. He was getting ready to go to work, second shift at the Blue Jean factory in town. He told us to stay away from that place until he could go check it out. Mom overheard us and told us if we went back out there, she would tear our butts up. Getting mauled by a bear is not something we wanted, so we agreed. Just to be sure, Dad gave us a few chores to keep us occupied until he got back home, splitting firewood and breaking up coal. That was enough to end our adventures that day. The rest of the week was uneventful, except for the news of the earthquake. That was the topic at school and at home for the rest of the week. By the weekend, Dale and I had decided we were going to go back and explore that cave to see if there really was a bear in it. Pretty dumb, but we decided to go armed with pocket knives and sharp sticks to take care of the bear if there really was one, or at least we thought we would. We climbed the hill back to where the cave mouth was. A couple of nighttime rains had washed away the mud and made the mouth of the cave bigger and easier to get in and out of. We made our way inside the cave and passed the smell, which was very much still permeating from the entrance. Once inside, we crouched and walked back to the back side of the cave. The cave entrance narrowed to an opening in the back wall that sloped down at a pretty steep angle, like a set of steps. We continued deeper and noticed there were no bones or animal remains back in this part of the cave. It went back another hundred feet and stopped at a rather large hole that seemed to go straight down. The strangest part was that we could feel air coming up from out of the hole. It was warm air. Shining the light down into the hole, we could not see the bottom. We didn't have enough rope to go farther, so we made our way back out of the cave. Undaunted, we wanted to know how deep that hole was. We used the lantern to build a fire, and we made some makeshift torches. Dale was one of the best fire starters I'd ever seen. Within minutes, we were equipped with torches and were back in the cave. We dropped a torch down the hole. It hit the bottom about 20 feet down. It opened up into a room with a dirt-covered floor. Then, there was a growl. It was unlike anything I've ever heard in my life. It was coming from somewhere down in that hole, from something. It sounded like a tiger or a lion, some sort of big cat, more than that of a bear. Then, it screamed so loud we dropped our gear and covered our ears. We could see from the torch lights it was circling the torch, but staying away from most of it. It was looking up at us, big and lean, definitely not a bear, more like a mountain lion, but its fur was black as pitch and its ears were like a doberman's, straight and tall like horns. It didn't look like any cat or dog or bear. Its eyes glowed red in that firelight, like two hot coals. It would look at me, then at Dale, as if it were trying to decide who it would kill first. When it screamed again, it was like having a ton of sand dumped on you from above. I went down to my knees and tried to curl into a ball. The scream made me feel weak, unable to think or move. My head felt like it was a gong, or someone had placed a giant bell on my head and started to beat at it. I felt sick, confused, in pain, all at the same time. Dale collapsed into a ball with his hands on his ears. He had dropped the lantern, and it had rolled off the edge, down into the hole. It went pitch black up top, but the bottom of the hole burst with light as the lantern shattered right beside the thing. Another scream came from it, this time a scream like it was in pain. We didn't feel weakened from it this time, we were just terrified. It was like the spell had been broken and we were free. 
Our survival instincts kicked in, and we took off. Dale and I made our way up the slope as fast as we could. We could tell that whatever that was in the hole was going to come after us. We just knew that it would not let us live for dropping that lantern. It was like there was a connection to the thing in our mind, and it was talking to us. Once up the slope, we could see the dim light at the entrance, and we quickly made our way back. Just before we reached the mouth of the cave, we heard the scream again. This time, it was like being hit by water coming out of a fire hose. It knocked both of us down as we desperately covered our ears, then tumbled forward toward the entrance. We got out of the hole and ran all the way home with tears pouring down our faces. Neither one of us could hear for a week. I remember having a headache that was so bad, my parents took me to the emergency room. The doctor couldn't find anything wrong with us, other than the many scratches and bruises we had from the cave. We were told that we were very lucky to be alive, as there are a lot of poisonous gases in caves, and that was probably what was causing the headaches, but it should pass. About a week later, it was just a ringing sound in my ear, but I will never forget it. I remember having the strangest dreams for months afterward, dreams where I was back in that cave with that screaming thing. I would wake up curled into a ball again, just like before. I think Dale experienced the same thing. We never went back to the cave. It was very unlike us, but we weren't courageous enough to go back there. My family moved soon afterwards, and Dale and I lost contact. Many years later, I went back, after hearing that they'd had another earthquake. I wanted to visit and see if that cave was still there. It is, although it looks like part of the roof collapsed in on it. I tried to look up Dale, too, but he had moved away. The twins were there, working at a local garage. They said Dale lived there for about ten more years. He never quite got over the experience. Actually, he ended up being sent away to a special school for the deaf for several years. When he did come back home, he was a very quiet person. Didn't make many friends. He lived with his parents and worked at the mill for a while. Everyone said he kept to himself and that he liked to drink. I don't know what it is that the earthquake opened up back then. I guess I'll never know. I do know this, though. It was more than just a bear. More than just a mountain lion. This thing had the ability to use its cry to disable its enemies or prey. I'm not sure which we were to it. I also know it was smart enough to get into our heads. I've never known another animal that can do that. Stones Throw Away From Appalachian Salamander I've been meaning to start telling some of these strange stories that have happened to me and my family on here for a long time. I wasn't sure where to start. That had kept me from writing about it, until now. Because now things are getting more frequent, and as of writing this, these things are nightly occurrences. I live in the heart of Appalachia, which is one of the tallest, most forested parts of the entire mountain range. We've had our share of sightings of ghosts, lights in the sky, things of that nature. But the biggest problem we have is the wood boogers, or the mountain boss, which I will explain in a moment. My grandmother and my father are from a small native reservation in the mountains. We've grown up with the stories of the entities and monsters that can hide in the hills and hollers of our land. Growing up, my grandmother never let us go outside after dark even if it was earlier in the evening, because dark comes early here in the winter. If the sun was down, we were inside. We weren't allowed to be loud either. We couldn't look out the windows after dark or whistle after the sun set. Now, we kept cattle, and whenever a calf was born, they'd be kept inside the barn at night, no matter what, with all the lights in the barn on. Often, my dad will sit up at night, watching both the barn and the ridgeline, with his trusty rifle to make sure nothing happened. 
especially since predators can be attracted to the smell of blood from the birth. Where we live now is a few miles from the reservation, and it's over a mile off the state road, up a winding gravel road. And while we have pasture land we keep the cattle on, most of our lands are heavily wooded. To say it's remote is putting it fairly lightly. We live about half a mile up from our grandparents on the family-owned land. It's been in the family on my grandfather's side for over 100 years. For years, it seemed that most of these things were just what I said before. Stories. Different family members had stories to tell, of things they'd seen or things they'd heard. Not that my siblings and I didn't believe them. It was just we'd never seen anything ourselves. Until recently. The first time I heard it myself, my sister, father, and I were sitting on the porch having a late night session, just catching up with one another. My sister's dog, Tony, a fearless pit bull, began to growl from her spot under the bench. She stood up and moved over to the edge of the porch, looking at the edge of the woods. Her hackles were raised in a way I'd never seen. Tony stopped growling and backed up a bit, still on her guard. But her tail was tucked, like she was afraid of something. Then came the first loud, resounding knock, 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 knock. knock, knock. Three in a row, with long, probably 15-second pauses between each knock. After the knocks, I realized they were the only sound left out here. Other than that... All I could hear was my own breathing. We sat in silence, waiting for something, anything else to happen. We could hear some fallen leaves and branches moving. I saw Tony's ears perk back up. Whatever it was, it was large, but moving back up along the ridge. From the other side of the holler, or the opposite ridge, we heard another set, deeper, as if it was a harder wood. Knock, 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 knock. This time, though, it was a set of five, all coming from the opposite ridge. After a few moments of whispered discussion about this, the first call split the silence. They're just like you hear people talk about on Bigfoot shows. The whooping screams and calls. As we talked more about it, I learned my spouse had seen one years ago. My dad told us about times when he was still working for the police. He'd been called out about something or someone being outside people's houses, and when he showed up to the calls, he would hear the wood knocks, and he'd smell musty, stinky smells like rot and wet dog. After the night we first heard it together, I don't know if I was simply more aware of things happening, or if the activity just picked up. But things have been happening more often. Apples and pears have been stolen off our fruit trees. A chicken or two would go missing from the coop. Screams came more often, sometimes so close, you could hear it inside the house. Recently, my sister saw one for herself for the first time. She stopped and backed up, pulling in at an angle to see better. She turned on the bar light on the front of her truck. She told us what she saw was at least seven and a half feet tall, maybe even eight feet, considering the tree it was standing behind. It was peering out from behind the tree. Only part of its body could be seen, which revealed reddish-brown matted hair. Before my sister and I decided to share these stories, two different occurrences happened that scared me pretty bad. We were in silence, basically just scrolling on our phones, when a long, clear whistle came from the ridge closest to our house. She and I froze, looking at each other. Then a second, shorter one sounded, followed by a clear knock, which may or may not have been followed up by more. That's when the two of us darted back into the house as quickly as we could. We told our dad about it, and after supper, we went out to check about the cattle and take the dogs to go to the bathroom. He sent my sister and I both a text, which read, Quietly and quickly, step out here. When we joined him outside, he was in the yard, 
still in the light of our outdoor flood lamp, looking towards the tree line. It was the same tree line that Tony often stared into. There were no normal sounds of the night either. No insects, no animals. Except something was whistling in a weird, warbling way. Like it wanted to sound like a screech owl, but was just wrong. It was similar, but also very different than what we'd heard earlier. And it kept repeating itself. Then it stopped. For a long moment, it was quiet. Then came a low, bellowing call. It was loud and close enough that we just came in for the night. At the very least, there's always something to be heard there at night. I just want people to know that there's such a thing as Sasquatch, and they're very much active in Appalachia. It wasn't a raccoon. From Red Scarecrow 99. Before I recollect this story, allow me to give some background. I've spent my whole life in the mountains of northeast Pennsylvania. I've spent considerable time in the wilds, hunting, fishing, and camping. I've been lucky to see almost all the wildlife this state has to offer, but I do believe there are many things out there that we as humans don't know about or don't understand. It was late summer 2015. My ex-wife, whom shall remain nameless here, grew up in the streets of Trenton, New Jersey. She had never had the opportunity to camp, and my family wanted to give her a taste of our rural lifestyle by arranging a quote-unquote camping trip in my parents' backyard for a weekend. It wasn't exactly roughing it, as we would be staying in a pop-up camper only 25 yards from my parents' cottage. Most of the weekend was delightful. There was plenty of fishing, hiking, swimming, and campfires, toasted marshmallows included. Just me, my family, my ex-wife, and our two lab mixes, named Yoshi and Max. We'd already spent two nights in that camper, and this was to be the last night. My father, a salt-of-the-earth kind of guy, cautioned us on an incoming rainstorm. We chuckled and went to bed, excited to sleep under a thunderstorm. The idea of the sound of the rain on the roof of the camper sounded pleasant. We said our goodnight and put the dogs to bed, shortly before turning in for the night ourselves. My now ex-wife and I talked briefly about how nice the weekend had been, before falling asleep rather quickly. We'd swam all day, and we were exhausted. I awoke sometime around midnight. It was tough to say exactly when, but it was pitch black out. The camper was softly rocking, and I could hear distant thunder rumbling. I closed my eyes, trying to go back to sleep, only to be torn from sleep again some time later by the crack of thunder that shook the camper more. My wife and I both bolted upright, and the dogs began to bark as the rain came down like bullets from the sky. We had just started to discuss our next steps when we heard it bare feet running down the flagstone path from the cottage to the camper. We both assumed it was my parents, coming to wake us up, to tell us to seek shelter in the house. We're coming, Papa Bear, my ex-wife yelled out as the dogs began to growl. Now, Yoshi is a lab Akita mix, and in his prime, he was 125 pounds. But even he ducked under the table and hid with the more skittish Max, Suddenly, something punched the camper door with enough force to rock the little pop-up. We both screamed as the camper leaned to one side, like something was pulling it down, and a loud bang came from the roof as something jumped up. It was pitch blackout, which was odd. The yard light didn't even turn on with its motion sensors. The dogs began to bark furiously as my wife began to sob. We were both terrified. In the darkness, I whispered, I'll send the dogs first, then me, then you. Run to the house for Dad, and don't stop for anything. She continued to cry, but I could barely see her nod. I flung the door open and yelled, Yoshi! Max! Go! They took off running at my command. I hopped out unarmed, but remembered the hatchet my father used for the campfire. 
It was only a few feet away. I scooped it up as my wife ran screaming. The motion-sensing lights finally came on, shining on the downpour and revealing the yard. I looked up to my horror. There was nothing there. I was greeted with only rain and wind as my father was dragged, in his undies I may add, to the back porch by my mother. Whatever had attacked the camper and jumped on top of it had vanished. The camper itself was surrounded by a small patch of trees that had no low-hanging limbs. I would have heard or seen it drop, but there was nothing. Shaken up, I went inside and told my dad and mom what happened. My dad doesn't believe in the supernatural or paranormal. I was told numerous times about large raccoons and was admonished for running away from tree rodents. But I was promised an investigation in the morning. Needless to say, only the dogs got sleep that night. At first light, we went outside. I retold my story and showed my dad how the camper was solid as I jumped up and down on it. There wasn't any sway when I did it. It couldn't have been the wind. I tried to rock it myself, and I'm six foot one, 230 pounds, rock solid, and I gave it no sway. The scariest part was when he, my dad, got the ladder to examine the roof. There above the door was four long fingerprints in the algae. S See? Uh, raccoon paw prints. Dad, I said, just look at the prints. The fingers are seven inches long. He just shook his head and went back inside. Now I know it wasn't the wind, and it wasn't a raccoon. I have no idea what paid us a visit that summer night, but I'm glad it didn't stick around. Banshee in the Fog From Celtic Kin Irish folklore is littered with mysterious and terrifying creatures, the kind that sound so unbelievable, which people speak of with such conviction that you can't help but wonder if there must be a layer of truth buried in there. Older folks, in particular, still hold a belief of the fairy folk and lore of ancient Ireland. Before she passed away, my grandmother would have sat us down in her cottage and filled its walls with the tales of all kinds of spirits, from silently watchful black hounds to the Kelpie, a water horse that would seduce you into riding it, then dart into the depths of a lake or lock, and drag you down into the murky abyss. When my parents would collect us, Mom would scowl when she found out about the ghost story session, knowing that neither my brother nor I would be getting much sleep that night. Nevertheless, I cherish these fireplace memories, as they take me back to a simpler time, when the dark winter evenings would be filled with life in the form of Granny's lilting aged voice, my favorite of these creatures, or perhaps least favorite, I suppose, given the endless amount of nightmares it implanted into my mind as a child, was the Banshee, a spirit tied to particular families. Legend has it that she appears in different forms, but tends to favor that of either a beautiful but distraught woman or a hunched, ailing older washerwoman, if it appeared by sight at all. It's even more distinct, you see, by its unearthly cry. Its wails and weeps would fill a room or would be audible for miles away across countrysides. The person who crosses paths with the banshee or its cry should quickly alert the family, as this is a signal that someone from the family has died or is set to die. Yes, the banshee is an omen of death. As I grew older, I became cynical to the tales my grandmother had spouted, including that of the Banshee. I moved into the city for university at 18, and immersing myself with life in the modern world, the ways of country life seemed to evaporate. A small-scale reflection of the increasingly modernizing world, I guess. Sad when you think about it, isn't it? That brings me to the one particular summer. 
My parents had recently downsized to a small cottage deep in the barren Irish West, where the roar of city life was inaudible. I stayed with my parents for the month of July, spending long, languid days roaming the nearby fields, looking out for signs of wildlife, such as the foxes that roamed late at dusk, or the bats that flew low along the lanes, which were laden with sprawling plant life. My story begins in the second week of my stay. I had taken to going for twilight walks, making the most of our northern sun, which can see daylight, lasting until close to 11 p.m. I was some miles away from the house, but could sense darkness approaching, and decided to make my way back home. Nighttime in that part of the country is utterly dark, not something you want to find yourself swallowed by. It was as I was walking back that I heard it, the most startling, biting cry. It seemed to fill the world around me, as though echoing against stone walls, even though I was surrounded by open nature. I can try to describe it by saying that it was on one hand the sound of a woman in sharp pain, but equally that of a grieving mother, sobbing at the loss of her child. I was momentarily horrified, in one moment it seemed that all my cynicism was laid to rest, and that I should run home without question. What sort of horrific creature was capable of producing a sound like this? However, I then tried to apply some logic. Can't foxes make the most spine-tingling noises when they're distressed, or even in heat? There had to be a purely natural explanation to this, despite how undisputedly unnatural it sounded. Whatever it was, I didn't want to stick around to find out. I'll run back home, I decided, and I would tell my parents, just in case someone was genuinely in distress or harm. I began to pick up my pace, breaking into a jog, but something in my peripheries of my vision brought me to a sharp and sudden stop. To my left was Bogland, an area that I had been warned never to walk in as it would be all too easy to sink into the wet ground and become stuck, or even suffocate. It was shocking to me then that in the midst of this Bogland stood a woman, a woman with long silvery blonde hair twisting in the evening breeze. The relative distance and encroaching darkness made it hard to make her out entirely, but she looked to be in her early to mid-twenties, my age, and her face was contorted in what looked like either pain or horror. It was from her mouth I realized that that bone-chilling scream had emerged. Initially, I was stunned. This was so unlike anything I'd experienced in this part of the world so far, which seemed so devoid of alarm or drama or consequence before. But I shook myself then and called out to the woman as loudly as I could. Hello! Hello. What's, wrong? What's wrong? Are you stuck? Are you stuck? She seemed to register me then, small eyes turning in my direction. But there was no response, aside from the continuous screech which now pounded in my head. Hello? Hello? I'm going to try to get you some help. I'll be back as soon as I can. With that, I ripped my eyes from the woman, darting back to the house as fast as I could. I was around a mile away, but phone signal was limited in that part of the country and I knew I would need to get home in order to do anything to assist the woman. It would have been a risk to my own life to have walked across the bogland towards her. When I made it back home, my parents' warm faces quickly dropped to looks of alarm upon registering me. What is it? You look like you've seen a ghost. I quickly filled them in on what I'd seen, and they sprung into action, grabbing the phone and alerting the local Garda, our police force. In the meantime, 
My father and I leapt into the car to make our way back to the spot, while my mother waited for the Garda to arrive. By car, we were there within minutes. I quickly directed my father to where I'd seen the woman. I pride myself on my sense of direction, and the lane is fairly straightforward, so I was utterly bemused when I realized there was no woman in sight, nor sound within earshot, save for the standard noises of a country evening. We scanned the area, but still nothing. When my mother arrived with the constable, he questioned me about where I'd seen the woman and raised his eyebrow when I said that she was no longer there. There's no way she would have been submerged in that space of time. You said she was standing fully upright when you saw her, correct? That's right. She was a bit of a distance away, but it didn't look like her legs were submerged yet. It was the screaming that made me run for help. He nodded. Okay, son. Thank you. Could you, very clearly, tell me once again exactly what you saw? Try not to leave anything out. I did so, relaying the story to him again and trying to interpret his facial reactions as I did so. He remained quite neutral, writing my account onto his notepad. When I finished, he paused, then spoke slowly. Right. I'm going to say first off that given how few people live around here, I myself can't say that I know anyone fitting that description. I like to think I know each and every one around these parts. However, I'm going to file a report and investigate this further. It might be that she got herself free and just walked off again. Here he stopped and bit the end of his pen, looking thoughtful before continuing with some visible discomfort. I want to thank you for alerting me about this. I want to say, though, before I set off, I have heard cases like this in the past. Figures. Figures of women appearing around the countryside, alarming passers-by with their cries. I, well, again, officially I'm going to handle this as I'd handle any other case but I want you to do me a favor. Check in with your family tonight. See how everyone's doing. This might sound odd, but can you do that for me? Dad looked perplexed at this. Dad seemed like he wanted to ask some more questions, but Mom interjected, nodding. Yes, officer. I think I understand you. We'll do that. With that, we drove home. The darkness of the land around us was impenetrable, aside from the light of the car's full beam. It was a moonless night. We didn't need to contact our family members that evening, because they reached out to us first. My mother's brother-in-law had sent her a message while we'd been out. The message wasn't long. It simply read, Hi, Bridget. Tried to contact you, but no reply. Please call. When Mom got through, she was distraught to find that her sister had passed away that evening. It had been a sudden medical event that nobody could have predicted. Aunt Sarah had been living with her husband and family in the USA for years. Most years we saw her biannually, but her death shook us nonetheless. In the days that followed, we sprung into action, assisting with funeral arrangements in whatever way we could, booking flights to Boston. I didn't voice it to my parents, not wanting to upset them further, but I couldn't help but consider the incident with the woman in the bog and what the officer had said to us. My logical mind tried its best to protest, but my memory kept tiptoeing back to those stories my grandmother had told me years ago, particularly those of the Banshee. Was it possible this could have been the explanation? Was the woman in that field trying to alert me, trying to warn me 
about the impending death of my aunt. It took two years for me to bring this up to my mother. I was once again visiting home. We were drinking tea in the garden. It was yet another summer evening at twilight, and I was taken back to that night by the bog. I voiced my memories to mom, asking her if she remembered what the constable had said. She gazed into her teacup, sighed, and looked at me slowly. Yes, son, I remember. Do you recall me telling him that I thought I might understand? Yes, Mom, I do. Your dad was ready to question him more. Well, this might sound crazy to you, but I did understand. You see, about three years before that, something similar had happened. I breathed in, and she must have seen my eyes go wide. Oh no, I didn't see a woman like you did, if that's what you're thinking. But I did hear a cry from within the walls of our old home on the evening your granny passed away, as though someone was screaming deep inside our house. Of course, the difference was we were prepared that time. We knew it was only a matter of days or even hours, but I did hear the cry. It terrified me at the time. It's part of the reason we sold up and moved to this cottage. I was dumbstruck. When I finally found my voice, I told her I hoped that she hadn't come to hate the new house following what I'd seen two years before. Oh no, she responded. No, I actually think it's helped me deal with the first occasion, believe it or not. You see, I think maybe it's not a bad thing. She was distressed, you say, when you saw her there. The woman in the bog, I mean. Well, perhaps she was just as sad as we were. Perhaps she's just part of our family. I do wonder if anyone has seen or heard her in the past. Your grandmother... Well, you remember her stories. I used to grimace when I came home to you and your brother shuddering on the sofa. I still stand by that. She smiled wistfully at me as she said this, and I was transported back to the corner of that old sofa. But it could be that she knew there was some truth behind what she was saying. Perhaps your grandmother, my mother, had at some point seen... Our sad friend, too. With that, she finished her tea, lifting both cups from the table and walking to the sink. I was left there filled with thoughts, nostalgia, and an overwhelming sense of closeness to my own family, culture, and land that I hadn't felt before. One of actually a few weird things... From M. Hopper 1000 When I was about 11, maybe 12, my family and I moved out to the middle of some abandoned strip mines in rural Alabama. It was awesome. Going swimming in quarries, lots of abandoned equipment and cliff faces to climb, caves and miles and miles of trails, and abandoned dirt roads used by the mines to explore. The trade-off was there were a lot of venomous snakes, and at night, it was dark. No street lights, just the occasional porch light, maybe every mile or so on the main road. One day in particular, my friend P and I were out on one of the dirt roads that went off to the side of the main mine road. We hadn't been down that road before, but it was like 10 a.m. on a bright summer day so we figured, why not? We had gone maybe a mile down that road when we came to a left-hand turn. Beside that left-hand turn and alongside the road we were walking on was a small lake. We walked up to the lake and we watched small frogs and a turtle swimming around. Around then, I caught movement across the lake. I saw a man then. He walked away from us heading up the hill I poked my friend P and pointed it out. Who is that? Why is he out there? We were miles into the mine trails. No people anywhere, no houses nearby. 
We both stood up, and as soon as we got right on our feet, the man stopped walking. In a split second, he spun around and started to run right in our direction. We bolted, and I mean we ran like Forrest Gump. I looked back, and he was running faster than any person I'd ever seen. He covered the distance. He had to run down the hill and around the lake to get close to us, a route which was easily 300 yards, in seconds. P grabbed me and we jumped off the road into a ditch behind some bushes. We hid ourselves. I peeked out, and he was maybe 30 to 40 feet from us then, spinning around in the road. He was making this god-awful grunting sound. And, weirdly enough, I swear he had an entire cooked chicken in his hand. He was wearing absolutely tattered and destroyed overalls, dirty boots, and he had what I can only describe as a Cro-Magnon brow, a huge brow. Now, my memory might not be super accurate, given how long it's been, but it seemed like his forehead stuck out a good several inches over his eyes. He was the scariest thing I'd ever seen. He kept spinning around in the road and started running back the way he came. The two of us stayed there in that ditch for nearly an hour, afraid to move. We just listened, watching, in case he was hiding and waiting for us. Eventually, when it felt safe to do so, we crawled along the roadside, all the way back to the main road. From there, we walked, but stayed in the tree line until we saw the main paved road. Then we ran, running all the way back home. We got home, told our fathers, and both of our fathers and P's older brothers loaded up and went looking for him. But they never found a thing. All these years later, and it still haunts me. Now, my girlfriend recently took me out to her grandmother's house to meet and spend time with her family. And where does dear old Granny live? Well, right on the edge of those same strip mines. I told her the story, and she looked really serious, saying, Y'all are lucky. There's all kinds of bad things that happen in those mines. So yeah, every visit to Grandma means the Glock and the 12-gauge ride with us. That's my creepy encounter story. Update. I forgot to mention this until I was telling my dad about writing about this story on Reddit. He reminded me of something. I got beaten up really badly my last day of summer school. So to make me feel better, and for passing summer school, my parents bought me a Kawasaki motocross bike. My dad had an old Honda racing bike, so we tried to ride out there any chance we got. One day, we were out deep in the mines, and I saw a wooden crate or box off the road in the bushes. It looked about six feet long, maybe 18 inches high. Me, being a nosy kid, I walked over and looked inside. There was a ton of hay, a blanket, and an old pillow. I called my dad over and showed it to him. I remember him looking around, and he said to me, If someone's living in that way out here, they don't want to be found or bothered. Let's go home. So we hopped on the bikes, rode home, no problems at all. But the weird thing was, my dad sat out on the front porch with the light off most of the night, just staring at the edge of the woods. He never explained why, and I can't believe I never put these two incidents together, but now I think I know. Apparently, he never saw anything or anyone, because he came in late that night, went to bed, and never sat out there again. My Weird Childhood From Jolly Jello As someone who grew up in one of the most urban parts of my country, and always heard that the woods were the most haunted places, I was quite surprised when I saw and heard as many things as I did. After all, the other tales of the women in my family, who have this almost sixth sense, 
were always either religious or rural ones. For context, it seems that this gift always jumps a generation. It's always the ones that have a birthmark on their right cheek, as I've noticed that me, my grandma, and my great-great-grandma all have it. Once is coincidence, twice is probability, thrice is possibility. Now, I've had a very nice childhood. That sort of early 2000s feeling of growing up with no worries, other than your Tamagotchi dying. I would spend my days with my dad and nights with my mom, since my father worked the night shift and my mother had the usual 9 to 5. My routine would be waking up, spending time with my dad, having lunch and going to school, and later dad would pick me and my mother up and bring us home. Soon after that, he'd go to work. He'd be back by 3 a.m. to eat something, only to be home again at around 6 a.m. My only real problem was bedtime. I hated going to sleep alone. I would always wake up during the night and see them in the hallway. Shadowy figures, ones that almost resembled my dad, but I knew for a fact it wasn't him. Maybe it was the size, but again everything looked big to a six-year-old. There was also this sway to them, the way that they moved. I couldn't stop thinking that they reminded me of my father. If he was a dark, shadowy, floating, paranormal creature that didn't make any noise and seemed to move really fast, he would definitely look like that. I saw these beings every night, but as the scaredy cat that I am, all I could ever do was stare at them, watching their movements as more seemed to appear at every blink. First, it was just one, but as time went on, there were more. I remember counting eight of them at once, all going between the kitchen, living room, dining room, and bathroom in their crazy dance as my stomach turned on itself in fear until I passed out from tiredness, only waking up in the morning. This went on for about two years, until one day I decided it was enough. I was tired, sad, and angry because of things that were going on in my school life, and those darned shadows wouldn't even let me sleep. I could deal with the living during the day, but I needed some me time at night. So in my brilliant eight-year-old heart, but not so brilliant mind, I mustered up some courage, went to my doorframe, and whispered, Daddy, is it you? That was a bad idea. Every one of those shadowy figures all looked at me at the same time with those hollow eyes. It was the first time I'd actually looked at their faces, and suddenly I wasn't so scared. They looked at me and disappeared, calmly like fog going away in the morning. It was peaceful. I never saw them again, but I don't believe they meant any harm. Maybe, just maybe, they were as scared of me as I was of them. Or they weren't aware that someone could even see them and decided to move somewhere else. Or maybe they hid themselves better. But again, they never did any direct harm. And even though I don't understand why they were there, I know that the way they looked at me was way less scary than how some of the living have. Do not play with the unknown, and definitely don't let your guard down. But do keep in mind that not everything unexplainable out there is there to harm you. Faceless Men of Weed Hill Road From Mimi Clyde I suppose to begin this story I should describe exactly where this area is, and a bit about myself. I live in Connecticut, but for my early years I lived in the small town of Barkhamstead. It's a truly beautiful area year-round, and I'm blessed to have lived there. Just the thought of being up there makes me nostalgic. However, no peaceful country town is without its local legends, right? It began when I was young, late preschool in fact. I know you might be thinking I'm just remembering this wrong since I was so young. But my family members also remember the event. When I was young, my family used to like to take me trailblazing. We would go down abandoned roads, 
forging new paths through the woods behind our property. On the edge of the three towns, Barkhamstead, Granby, and Heartland, is a road known as Broad Hill Road. It was also labeled as a no-outlet path, but one day after going to the library in Granby, my grandmother decided we should take her Subaru outback and go trailblazing to see where this road really ends. It started out nice. We saw a few nice houses. We kept going up the steep slope until the road eventually turned to dirt. We drove on through this road, which was more so a glorified muddy path in the middle of the woods. We soon passed by a sign for Weed Hill Road. We parked and started to trailblaze. We looked around for a bit, slicing through vines like we were on an expedition. We eventually found what appeared to be the ruins of an old bridge, and as the sun started to set, we got back in our car and headed home, finding that the dirt path came out on the back end of a farm. Amazed that it went through, we decided to go and tell the family back home about our findings. After a home-cooked meal, my mom, my aunt, and my uncle all decided to head out once more, as they wanted to see Weed Hill Road for themselves. Mind you, they were all practically college students still. Leading my first trailblazing expedition was an amazing feeling. When we arrived back at Broad Hill Road, the sun had already begun to set. So when we reached the woodsy dirt path, we had to have our headlights on, and we stayed in the car due to the abundance of wild animals in the area. Let me preface that my uncle is a prankster. He loves to mess with people to make me laugh. So when we reached Weed Hill Road and saw an abandoned truck, my uncle got out of the driver's seat and picks up a stick. He pokes the passenger side door and keeps saying, knock, knock, and hey, it's cold out here. My family was losing it laughing, myself included. However, that all changed when a chill ran up my spine. There was no abandoned truck in that area. In the time that my family was having dinner, this truck was parked in front of the washed out bridge. I tapped my mom on the shoulder and I told her that it hadn't been there before. She then yelled for my uncle to get out of there because there's probably some kids doing something in that car, maybe doing substances or other unsavory acts. So my uncle listened he got back into Grandma's Subaru Outback. But then he had one more trick up his sleeve. I'm gonna high beam him, he chuckled, to the dismay of my aunt, who was his girlfriend at the time. She told him to stop messing with the poor teens, probably sitting in that car terrified. Yet my uncle flicked on the high beams, only for us to be met with a strange sight. Two people slowly set up in the front seats of the abandoned truck, and a third leaned in from the back. Now I say people with quotes because these people were not human, at least not anymore. Instead of faces, they had three vertical fleshy folds running up and down their faces. My aunt screamed in terror. What's wrong with them? What the heck are they? My uncle just keeps laughing as he mutters to himself, what kind of drugs are they on? My mom and I just sat in the back seats, watching. I wasn't scared, more so interested in what was wrong with these folks. As we sat there in a stare down with these faceless beings, they slowly started to sway in a circular motion in their seats, which evolved into thrashing faster and faster and faster. Suddenly, my mom yells, Drive! My uncle steps on it, throwing it into reverse, but then the back of the car hits a rock. We probably hit 70 miles per hour getting to the farm on the other end of the road. Yet when we pull onto the main road, my mom says she wants to get out and check the car for damage. Mind you, we were still in my grandma's Subaru Outback. We pulled off the road, only to realize that the right mud flap on the back had fallen off. So that's what the rock had done to the car. Great. My mom said we had to go back, or grandma was going to be teed off. After the adults shared some words, 
We headed back up Broad Hill Road in the pitch black night. When we arrived at the dirt path crossroads of Broad and Weed Hill, we found that the truck had vanished without a single tire track. This only added to the confusion as my aunt got out and grabbed the missing mud flap. She hopped back in the car and we sped away, more carefully this time. We soon encountered a group of hikers with a dog back near the farm. We slowed down, asking them if they'd seen any other cars, to which they replied no. Either that truck had driven the other direction, leaving no tire tracks, or it had, in fact, completely vanished. Eventually, we arrived home, all still a bit shaken, with the mud flap in hand. We climbed out of the car. My mom and I stopped, though. Deep in the woods, we could hear something, like a scampering, like something big was moving quickly on all fours. Then we heard it, a scream, then another, and another, women screaming as if they were being killed out there. I started to cry then. We were all the way across Barkhamstead, and now there were things in the woods. My mom says to me, Don't cry, it's most likely a fisher cat. I nodded and sniffled. Fisher cats are rare around here, but not unheard of, and they do scream a bit like that. Then the crickets went silent. Everything goes silent. As a woman's voice is carried on the wind. Don't cry. It mocked, but apparently only I heard it as my mom led me inside. Slowly the forest that surrounded our family's mountain home regained its regular noises. The next morning, I woke up earlier than usual around 6 a.m. For four-year-old me, that was unheard of. I got up and looked out the big window, facing our backyard, and I see this strange thing circling underneath the window. I rush downstairs to find my grandpa at the glass porch door. What's wrong, grandpa? I asked him. He doesn't look away from the window. Tell me you saw it too, son. I nodded. What is it? My grandpa looked at me, his pupils reflecting the sunrise's light. It had the ears of a cat, muzzle of a dog, too big to be any of the neighborhood cats or dogs, between the size of a big wolf and a small bear. It was covered in all black fur. He stepped towards me. Nothing to worry about. It's gone now, it's not going to come back. He sat down in front of the TV in his recliner. The fact it was here is our secret. Don't go telling people. Now how about some bacon for breakfast? All these years later, I think we encountered something pure evil that night on Weed Hill Road. Faceless men that followed us home, revealing their true forms of twisted black animals. I believe what we encountered was a hellhound, or many of them. The three men turned into a dog that could not be comprehended, at least not properly. They then followed us home with the sounds of screams and scampering. I think there's something bad out there, and if you wish to venture there now, well, good luck. I fought a demon and one from Visigoth. In July of 2000, I was forced to confront the fact that all the stories and myths I'd ever heard about demons were true. They are real, they are evil, and they want and are able to kill the living. I grew up in a Catholic household in the Midwest. My home life was very chaotic mostly as a result of my veteran father dealing with his shell shock by drinking excessively and getting in fights at poker games. My father had a hard time keeping a job, and we never seemed to have any money. My mom and dad argued constantly, and we moved frequently. 
so I never really felt any sense of comfort or stability at home. Just when I made some neighborhood friends or got into a rhythm at school, we would pack up and move, and I would be the new kid all over again. Years and years of living like this made me grow to resent my family, my community, and even my faith, which I decided at one point was just a scam to scare gullible people and line the pockets of the clergy. I never had any friends, so I put all my effort into my schoolwork. I got a scholarship to a university hours away from home. I studied psychology and criminal justice with the intent of becoming an FBI agent or a lawyer. I graduated with honors. After that, I immediately moved to California, leaving my former life and dysfunctional family behind. Everything changed for me in California. I got a great job working for a private investigation firm. I met a free-spirited, exotic young woman, and after dating for six months, we moved in together. My girlfriend, Salem, had a dark sense of humor. She liked much heavier music than I did and was into spiritualism, which I considered total bunk at the time. However, she did contrast my rather stoic and staid personality perfectly, so we got along really well. She was very attractive to me, and that may have clouded my judgment somewhat. Salem was always going on and on about crystals, psychics, and other esoteric topics, which I thought were just harmless hobbies of hers. She would go to psychic fairs every other week or so and always wanted me to go with her, but I never would. Finally, after months and months of pestering me to go with her, I agreed to attend one for her. It was not what I imagined it to be. For some reason, I thought it would be more like a renaissance fair or something, with gothic decorations and candles everywhere everyone wearing robes and pointy hats. Instead, it was held in a cramped little bland outlet in a strip mall. There were a dozen or so psychics giving different types of readings, from tea leaves to tarot cards and all manner of retail items for sale, primarily books, crystals, and herbs. Salem had a reading, then another from a different person, then another. Eventually, I was very bored and a little weirded out by some of the people there. But I just stayed by her side and kept my opinions to myself. Before we left, she bought a small purple crystal sphere that looked exactly like I always pictured a crystal ball to look, as well as a small pedestal for it to rest on. After that, we went home. That very same night, for the first time in my life, I stopped breathing in my sleep. I woke straight up, gasping for air. Sure, I know, there are numerous explanations for this to happen, but I was in my early 20s at the time and in great physical shape. I'd been studying martial arts for years, and I'd even taken up surfing once moving to California. My sudden case of breathlessness scared Salem, but I just blew it off as some sort of weird fluke. The next night, it happened again, only this time I opened my eyes and I was awake when I realized I wasn't breathing. I could hear myself making a gurgling, choking sound. I then bolted up in bed and began gasping for air again. Now I was scared too. Being a logical person, I got on the internet and began searching for possible reasons for what had happened to me. Sleep apnea seemed to be the most likely explanation, but I'd never had it before in my life, and it wasn't supposed to continue happening to you after you wake up. Keep in mind, the second occurrence I was wide awake. While still at my computer, I turned around. I was just kind of ruminating on things when my gaze fell upon the crystal sphere that Salem had placed on the entertainment center above our television. I then turned back to my computer typing in dangers of crystals into the search engine. The top two results were about the spiritual dangers of the uninitiated using crystals. The third and fourth results were about what the Bible says about crystals. 
I dove down an internet rabbit hole that lasted hours and consumed my thoughts. I didn't believe in spirituality, witches, demons, angels, or any of that stuff. But for some reason, I could not stop digging deeper and deeper into the topic. I read website after website about sacred stones in the occult, about how some believe crystals can be used to communicate with spiritual entities or even open a gateway to other dimensions. After every article or blog, I would shake my head and basically tell myself, yeah, right. But I just kept on searching and reading until I began to fixate on the crystal being the root of my problems. Still, it was just a hunk of rock, wasn't it? How could it possibly affect my sleep? There's no logical way that it could, right? One day, Salem came home from her sister's house. The two of us had a nice evening together. I didn't mention anything about the crystal or spending my days searching the dark corners of the internet for solutions to my sleep problem. We stayed up late watching a movie, and she fell asleep on the couch. I carried her to bed and went to sleep myself. She slept on the left side of the bed, me on the right. That night, it happened again. I woke up aware that I was suffocating. I tried to sit up and take a breath like I had the last time. But I could not sit up. I could not breathe. What little air that happened to go through my nose brought with it the scent of a terrible foul odor of wet earth and decay. The entire right side of my face felt frozen, like my head was being held next to an open freezer. Still gasping for air, I turned my head to the right, and there, inches from my face, was a man. Well, male in form, but it was not just a man. It was a creature, an entity, a demon. This wasn't a dream, not a hallucination, definitely not sleep paralysis, which seems to be the catch-all excuse for scientists as I was able to turn my head and look at it. It was there. It was real. The demon was, I assumed, hunched on the floor, just off the side of the bed. I could only see its head and the tops of its shoulders peeking up over the top of our bed. It leaned in toward me, jutting its narrow, pointy chin over the side of the bed in my direction. Its head was large and bulbous and hairless, its skin was a gray-brown, undulating mass of wrinkles, warts, scabs, and tumors. The eye sockets were large, angular, and hollow. It had no eyes to speak of, but deep down within its eye sockets, what seemed like a thousand feet within them, were two pinpricks of yellow light that were its eyes. The nose was bulbous and drooped down nearly to its mouth, which was another black chasm with a handful of gnarled teeth and rotten gums. It was the source of the cold that I felt on my face and the damp odor that filled my nostrils. Now, I grew up rough. I got in many fights as a kid, and as a young man, I hunted and fished with my dad. I'd even encountered real-life gangsters in both America and Mexico as a private investigator but nothing had ever come close to scaring me as much as that man, thing, or demon. It was like every cell in my body vibrated in horror all at once, desperate to escape it. I could not comprehend what I was seeing, but I knew it was pure evil. It never talked, it never moved, though its mouth did quiver ever so slightly and the yellow pinpricks of lights in its eye sockets twinkled. It just stared at me, or through me. When I tried to sit up, I heard my own voice in my head say, Stay in bed. It was my voice, but not my thought. Finally, after I don't know how long, seconds, minutes, or hours, I tore my gaze away from it, and I sat up in bed, gasping and coughing for air. Then, I screamed so loudly, I terrified Salem and woke up our landlord across the hall, who began to pound on our front door. 
Salem answered the door and told him that everything was fine, but she would not come back to bed with me, instead choosing to sleep on the couch. I was so drained, so utterly exhausted, that I passed out almost immediately after that and slept through the night. When I woke up the next day, I was alone. Salem had gone to work already. My bed sheets were utterly soaked in sweat, so I gathered them up and put them in a basket to wash them. The laundry room was down the hall from our apartment, right next to an old-style metal chute for the trash. Without even thinking, I just immediately tossed my sheets and pillowcases down the garbage chute rather than taking them into the laundry room. I went back to my apartment and the first thing, the very first thing that caught my eye was the purple crystal, which had reflected the morning light and was casting a purple beam across the wall opposite the entertainment center. The thing made me feel nervous and anxious. I didn't want to look at it. In fact, I hated it. Without a thought, I walked over, picked it up, squeezed it tight, and yelled, in the name of Jesus Christ, I cast you out. I hadn't been to church in over a decade, and I'd stopped praying long before that. But in that instant, I somehow knew what to say, what to do. Maybe I'd seen too many horror movies or whatever, but that's what I did. And believe me, writing this out and reading it back to myself, I know how utterly foolish it sounds for a grown adult a well-educated private investigator, no less, to yell something like that in an empty room. Nevertheless, that's what I did, that's what I said. And the very second I uttered that last word, I heard a rather quiet pop, and I felt warmth in my hand. I opened my fist to see that the crystal had cracked from the inside out. From the very center of this extremely hard piece of purple crystal, there was a six-pointed, star-shaped crack that extended nearly to the surface of the sphere. I couldn't believe that it happened, but it did. I felt amazed, relieved, but also terrified, because that meant that the demon was real after all. I ran out into the hallway and down to the garbage chute, tossing the crystal and its pedestal down into the black abyss of the chute. When Salem got home from work, I made up some story about our cat knocking her crystal off of the entertainment center. She shrugged it off. That night, I slept soundly, and I slept soundly every night after that. I broke up with Salem shortly thereafter, and I moved on with my life. I've never once stopped breathing in my sleep since, and I've never had any other experiences like it. I found my way back to a semblance of faith, and thankfully, I never encountered anything like that creature, that demon, again. Though it did seem to open up some awareness to other things. That demon was real. It wanted to kill me, and it very easily could have. I know that now, and I try not to think about it. And I've never told a single soul about it, because I know what people will think, and I have my reputation to protect. But when I do think about it, I can see it clear as day in my mind's eye. I can feel the cold malice of it, and almost smell it. I fought that demon, and I won. But I pray to God I never have to do something like that again. I do not judge or condemn people who consider themselves spiritual, or practice divination, or those who believe in psychics or witches or whatever. Nor do I believe that they're inherently bad or evil at all. What I want people to realize is that, yes, there are entities out there that are not human. We can see them, we can feel them, and we can experience them. And some of them, they want to hurt you and possibly kill you. If you're going to mess around with that sort of thing, do your research and protect yourself. Curse of the Morris Minor From Am Jean Romeo Back in July of 2018, 
my step-grandma on my dad's side, was involved in a car accident, which resulted in her being thrown through the side window of her husband's Morris Minor, down a hill, through a row of barbed wire, finally landing in a patch of mud. Obviously, she sustained serious injuries and was rushed to the nearest hospital. She had been driving down a country road in the small village of Lonmay, Scotland, where she lived with her husband. My granddad has offered to drive her, but she declined that time, proceeding on her way to go and pick up her daughter, who lived in the next village over. How she got into that accident is not exactly known, but the stretch of road she was driving down had a history of being dangerous for cars. We also don't believe she was wearing a seatbelt, as being an old car, it likely didn't have any. Despite the quick action of the emergency services and the dedicated care of the doctors and surgeons, she passed away in the hospital a few days later. They tried to wake her up, but she was unresponsive. My granddad was shattered. I remember my dad telling me, not long after this, that my granddad lost his faith in God then. Despite his prayers for the survival of his wife, he believed God had abandoned him, letting his beloved wife die. Adding to our sadness was the fact that my dad, my three siblings, and myself had been planning to go and visit my grandparents, which we'd scheduled for only a couple of weeks after the accident happened. We'd recently regained contact with my granddad and his family, so this was a bitter blow to all of us. Since then, my dad has kept in regular contact with his father in the form of weekly phone calls. This leads me to the story my dad relayed to me a few weeks back. He had been chatting with his dad on the phone one Sunday afternoon when my granddad brought up the topic of the accident. Knowing the sadness my granddad still felt, five years later, my dad tried to steer the conversation to another topic. My granddad went quiet for a moment before he proceeded to tell his son about how the Morris Minor car, now scrap metal, had come into his possession. He could not quite remember the exact date he bought that car. Nevertheless, he went on to describe the interaction he had with the previous owner, or should I say, the previous owner's wife. He had driven up to the property of the owner of the Morris Minor. Upon arriving, the owner of the car was nowhere in sight, However, my granddad was soon approached by a woman. My granddad described her as a witch of a woman. She was elderly. On the larger side, she walked with a cane, and when she saw my granddad get out of his car, she slowly approached. Her walking cane thudded on the tarmac drive. What do you want? She asked. Her voice was high, but it had a gravelly quality to it likely due to the strong smell of cigarette smoke that wafted from her. My granddad then explained to her that he was there to look at the Morris Minor for sale. He knew the owner and had been excited when he heard the car was for sale. He loved old cars. The woman's eyes opened wide, and she screamed at him. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's cursed. That darned car is cursed cursed, I tell you. My granddad stared at the old woman in shock. He let out a nervous laugh. What do you mean? How can a car be cursed? The woman glared at him and shuffled closer, until she was close enough she could wag a finger directly in front of his face. The last three owners of this car have all died. All of them. This thing is cursed. Don't buy it, unless you want the same thing to happen to you. The woman looked crazed, and my granddad just continued to stare at her. Moments later, another car pulled up. The owner of the car. My granddad was relieved to get away from the woman and headed over to greet the man. He and my granddad exchanged pleasantries, and soon my granddad was given a tour of the car. All the while, the old woman watched on, muttering to herself. My granddad, though a Christian, was not at all superstitious, and soon pushed the woman's comments to the back of his mind. He left that day, with the Morris Minor hooked up to the back of his own car. 
he was beyond ecstatic with his purchase, and he paid the comments of the woman no mind as he drove away. I was out for lunch with my dad when he told me this story. My mouth dropped open upon hearing what the woman had said. It left me feeling extremely creeped out. Even my own dad, who's a very logical man, was creeped out. He said that even he would have walked away from the car that day after hearing the comments from the old woman. The day of the accident, my granddad had offered to drive his wife. I can't help but think that maybe he was meant to be in that car that day and would have left his wife a distraught widow. How he went ahead and still bought that car despite the warning, I don't know. Even if the previous owners had died due to illness or other reasons, how could he not find it strange that every person who had owned that car had died? I imagine he lives with the guilt every day. The only solace was that he heard his wife's voice when looking down at her coffin at the funeral, letting him know she was okay. I'd like to hope that hearing her voice restored a little bit of belief back in him. Warning. The following story contains vivid depictions of violence against pets. The Animal Skinner From J. Dixon, 55 I'm a 29-year-old woman living in a relatively small town in Kentucky. Growing up, my mother sometimes had the most random boyfriends. It was while she was dating a guy that lived in a trailer park that these experiences happened. I was only about nine years old when all of this went down. The first experience came about one day when my mom took my two brothers and I to go and visit her boyfriend. The trailer park in which he lived was fairly large and surrounded by huge wooded areas. Many people lived there and someone even owned a small poodle breed dog that ran around playing with everyone and I think it loved getting pets from us. His name was Snoopy. Well, one day Snoopy went missing. He never showed up. That obviously wasn't normal for him. His owner told us that he never came back home one day, so a bunch of us got together and we went looking for him. We couldn't find him anywhere and we searched for hours. We'd pretty much given up hope when someone yelled out that they'd found something. I remember running over as a crowd gathered at the base of a tree in the backyard of my mom's boyfriend's place. My mom tried keeping us kids back, but it was too late. I got a good look at what it was people were freaking out over. It was a pile of skin and fur. Dirty, white, curly fur that was just like Snoopy's. Still attached to the skin, the rest of the body nowhere to be found. We all stared at it in shock, wondering how this could have happened. As far as we knew, no one would have wanted to hurt the little dog. He was a sweet little thing and never bothered anyone except to play. No explanation was really given, and that pile of skin and fur was quickly disposed of. A couple of weeks later, my mom wanted to go see her boyfriend again. Once again, she took me and my two brothers along, but first we stopped by a friend's place who happened to live in the very same trailer park. We were there for only a few minutes. When we pulled up and got out of the car, I noticed a little black cat. I love animals, so I went over to pet it before heading on into the friend's house. We must have been there around 10 or 15 minutes tops before leaving. While I walked back to the car, Something caught my eye, something glistening under the streetlight. It was nighttime at that point, so the streetlights were on. I approached it out of curiosity, and I was surprised to find the body of a small cat. It was the same size of the cat I'd just been petting only minutes ago. The only issue was the body had no skin, none whatsoever. The thing was just bone, meat, and muscle, but no skin, no fur. In fact, it was still wet, emitting some warmth from its body as if it had just happened. 
I pointed it out to my mom. She was disgusted, quickly telling me to leave it alone and to get in the car. I remember Snoopy coming to my mind then. I thought it odd that now two animals had been skinned with no explanation. As the days passed, I put these poor animals in the back of my mind. We kept on making visits to my mom's boyfriend, us kids hanging out in the neighborhood. Other non-related odd things happened here and there, like the time my oldest brother and I found a Pennywise clown suit nailed to a tree in the woods. For me, the scariest thing that happened was one day when my little brother and I were lying outside on a picnic table. It was the afternoon. We were in my mom's boyfriend's backyard. As we lay there, my little brother decided to take a nap. I wasn't really sleepy, so I just looked at the clouds for a while, surveying the surrounding area. This backyard was quite large. There was a big area of woods back there and a huge field that belonged to a neighbor. Only a thin rusted wire fence separated the field from the backyard. It was in the field that I saw something in the distance, something that wasn't there before. It was a figure standing there. At first glance, I thought it was a man. It didn't move at first, but then it seemed to notice me watching. And when it did, it moved forward. I noticed that it was oddly postured. The right shoulder dipped lower than the left, and its gait was a bit unsteady. As it drew closer, I saw more details. It was at least six feet tall, maybe more, and what I had thought was clothing now looked like rags from a distance hanging off the figure. Its arms were longer than humans should be, and the hands looked way bigger, possibly even clawed. I soon realized this was no man that I was looking at. My eyes widened, and I shook my little brother awake, pointing to the figure and asking, Do you see that? He rose and looked at the figure, and his eyes went wide. He replied with just a nod. I looked back too, realizing in horror that the thing had gotten even closer to us. From what I could see, it didn't even have a nose. Instead, it had what looked to be nostrils on its face, kind of how it would look if you cut the nose off a man. Its eyes were pitch black. It had an arm outstretched towards us, as if reaching out to us. I looked back to my brother and told him, We need to run. We both leapt off the table and ran as fast as we could, and I swear we could have given the Flash a run for his money. We ran towards the trailer, but we hadn't yet made it out of the backyard before that thing let out a scream. The scream is hard to describe, something like a roar mixed with nails on a chalkboard. It was terrifying, and neither of us looked back to see if the creature was any closer. We bolted inside, and of course I told my mom, but she didn't react the way I expected. She seemed to figure we were just imagining things. Naturally, I guess. But we refused to go back outside. My mom broke up with her boyfriend not long after that. So, I guess thankfully, we never had to go back to that trailer park. I'm glad. Something tells me that that thing my little brother and I saw was responsible for those skinned animals. Those woods surrounded the whole area of the trailer park, and I figure that's where it lives. That's how it travels. I recently asked my brother if he remembers that, and his response was, I sure do. What the heck even was that thing? We talked about a few theories, but we still aren't really sure. All I know is I'm glad we ran. There's no telling what could have happened had we stayed on that table and the creature caught up to us. The Black Dog From The Wolfman I've been sitting on this for a little while. I figure now is as good a time as any to get it in writing. As a warning, this will contain mentions of self-harm. 
I've only been driving trucks for around two years now, but I grew up around it here and there, and I love talking to the old timers about how the industry was during the golden age of trucking. I got to hear the good, the bad, and as I got into it myself, the superstition. Everyone, no matter who they run for, where they drive, or how long they've been in it, they've seen their fair share of it. I've witnessed pile-ups in the winter, vehicle fires in the summer, and I've beaten the coroner to a wreck once or twice. It's just the nature of the job. The more you're on the road, the more likely you're going to come across some unpleasant things. This incident, or what I believe it to be at least, still gets to me on some of the longer nights. To set up some background, and I apologize if it gets a little long, I'll go into it from the beginning. I started driving trucks at the end of the virus. I'd been laid off after five years at a factory with no telling of when it would reopen. So I looked around and decided that if truckers worked through this, I'd have a job through just about anything. I went to a small school, got my CDL, and got in with the company. After about a year, my buddy expressed interest in driving, so I talked to him and we got him into a company too that would train him and put him on the road. For this story, I'll call him S. S was a few years older than myself. He was in the National Guard Reserve and was looking for some work between deployments. He'd been in for a few years, messed up his knee on a training op, and was now looking to switch his enlisted job. While all the paperwork was in red tape limbo, he wanted to drive. I ran a flatbed through the northeast, and he ran a box for a supercarrier between Pennsylvania and out west. He even sent me pics of the world's largest truck stop off of Route 80 in Iowa. Rarely did we cross paths on the blacktop, but every once in a while, we ended up back in town for some off time. We'd meet up, have a few drinks, and swap stories. Now we've watched scary movies, and we told folk tales in the past around campfires, but never got too much into it. One night, he sat back in his chair and said to me, Hey, you ever seen the black dog? Now, this made me about choke on my drink. Most of us, we've all heard different things about the black dog. Some say it brings death. Others say it just warns you beforehand. You're always tired, but if you're too tired and starting to ride the rumble strip too much, you may see the black dog. So I sat back and told him my story of it. The way I see it, first time is a warning. You're tired, you get off the road, and you get some sleep. Second time, it'll make you stop. You'll experience something that'll get you to pull over. Animals in the road, mechanical mishaps, random traffic stop by police or DOT something that'll get you stopped. If you continue going after that, and you get back between the highway lines, it gets a little foggy from there. No way to know for sure what happens exactly, because from what I've been told, your time is up. Some guys wreck and don't survive. Some are found dead in their rig in the following days. Heart attack or exhaust leaks, the works. I've personally seen it once. It was a foggy night on Route 84 through New York. Happened back in February. I was dead tired. Coffee, energy drinks, Marlboros, nothing was working. I took my eyes off the road for a second to fiddle with the radio, and when I looked up, I saw it. Through the fog, something skittered off the shoulder and into my lane. A shadow in itself. It paused to look directly at me. A black, wispy canine shape with hollow, yellowish eyes. I shot upright in my seat. With a flatbed, you can't slam on the brakes or your load will come up to visit you in the cab. And with trucks in general, you can't swerve much or you'll roll over. So I just gripped the wheel and braced for an impact. But it didn't come. I passed through where the figure was and kept on rolling pulling off on the shoulder as soon as I could. When I got out, I went around to the front of my truck to look for damage, but there was none. No fur, no blood, nothing. She didn't have a scratch on her. I stood there slack-jawed for a few minutes before remembering the stories I'd heard 
and after putting two and two together, I darn well knew what I thought I encountered. So I climbed back in the seat, pulled off at the next off-ramp, and caught some much-needed sleep. I ended up being late to my delivery, but hey, I'm still around. I shifted in my seat and took another drink. He chuckled and replied, Well, I've seen it twice now, I think. I raised an eyebrow as he continued. Yeah, last week. I was headed east towards Ohio, and I saw it once along the side of the road. Now, I was pretty far from my delivery, so I just kept going. About two hours later, I thought I saw it again, but it ended up being a deer that shot into the road as I went to pass it. I ended up hitting the darn thing. I pulled over to check and thankfully it just busted some of the plastics. At this point in his story, I was a bit nervous, but obviously he was sitting across from me in my living room. I asked him, Well, what happened? I finished my run and I ended up delivering. I got some rest and started again. We both kind of laughed it off. Such is the industry. We finished our drinks and chatted into the early morning before hitting the hay. A week or so after that, I got a call from S. He'd gotten into some argument with his dispatch over getting home in time for a wedding, so he ended up quitting the job. He seemed a little angry about it, but nothing serious. Over the next week or so, his luck just kept getting worse. His motor blew in his car, he had even more work problems, money problems, relationship problems, the works. Two days into a vacation, I got another call from a different friend. They gave me the dire news that S had killed himself. He left a note, but none of us got the specifics. And while the army did their own investigation, I never heard from that either. It's been almost a year since, and I'll be the first to admit it may all be a real bad coincidence. But I'm dang scared to see that dog again. To everyone reading or listening, and to my fellow drivers, be safe. S, I miss you, brother. Warning. The following story contains depictions of harm against animals. The Pig Farm Werewolf from Benji B. The story I'm about to tell you happened when I was around 11 or 12 years old, so the year would have been 1999 or possibly 2000. I live in central Sweden. My parents had been divorced for many years, and the day of my encounter, my younger sister and I were visiting our dad at his farm. He raises slaughter pigs there for one of the country's biggest meat producers. I've always loved animals, and I enjoyed helping out at the farm, feeding the animals and cuddling with the piglets. My dad had built the pig housing just a couple of years before. Now, when you entered through the main entrance, you would find yourself at the beginning of a long corridor, with four doors on the right side and two doors on the left, with one door at the end of the corridor leading out to the back side of the building. The first door on the right led to an office and staff room, and the second door led to a storage room. The following two doors on the right and the last door on the left led to the three what we called pig stables, called stable number one, two, and three, each with 48 separate pens where the pigs were housed. The first door on the left went to the barn where we stored food and straw for the animals. Now, the way this farm worked was that we received pregnant sows a week or two before they were expected to give birth. And when the piglets were old enough, the sows were sent to the other farms to rest for a few months before they were impregnated again. The piglets stayed with us until they were old enough to be sent off to slaughter. Now back to the story. The day of my encounter was a very cold winter day, probably around December or January. The ground was covered in a thick layer of snow, and the sky was clear. A perfect winter day. My sister and I had arrived at our dad's place around lunchtime the same day. That afternoon, we were in the stables, helping out with the chores. I remember that in stable number one, 
it held slaughter pigs that were maybe a couple of months old. In stable number two, we had pregnant sows expecting to give birth at any day. And stable number three was empty. At the time, it had just been cleaned and prepared for a new delivery of pregnant sows to arrive within a few days. I remember my sister being so bored that day. The only thing she liked to do was cuddle and play with the newborn piglets, of which we had none at the time. My dad was in the empty stable, number three, working on a broken gate to one of the pens, which had been damaged when the slaughter pigs that were housed there earlier were moved. I had just fed the pigs in stable two when my dad told me that he had found one of the slaughter pigs injured. Now, it was quite common for them to get injured when they're in the teenage stage of life, trying to establish dominance and being very eager and playful. But it was unusual for them to get any serious injuries. Usually, it was just smaller scratches and bite marks. When he told me that this pig probably had a broken front leg, my heart dropped, because I knew that there was nothing we could do, and the pig would have to be put down to end its misery. I hated that. It was not often it happened, but when it did, I always teared up. I helped my dad to find the injured pig, and we carried it out through the door to the backside of the building. Out on the backside, there was a big round manure tank, approximately 15 meters in diameter and several meters deep, partly buried in the ground with just about a meter of the top above ground level. We carried the pig to the other side of the tank, and my dad brought a butchery bolt gun. But I refused to stay out there while my dad did what he had to do. I went back inside and I continued to feed the pigs, listening to music, trying to get my mind off of what happened to that poor pig. After a while, my dad came in to tell me he needed to go to his workshop to get some tools to fix the gate, and he asked if I wanted to stay here or come with him. His workshop was where he stored and maintained his agricultural machines and equipment. It was a 10-minute drive from the farm, and he said he would be back in half an hour. So I told him I would stay. I helped him carry some tools to his car, then watched him and my sister drive away. It was mid-afternoon by then, but it was already dark outside. Now I was alone on the farm, but I didn't mind that. We lived just south of the Arctic Circle, and in the winter we only have a few hours of sunlight from the late morning to early afternoon, so I was used to the short winter days and the darkness. At the moment the sky was still clear, but it was now covered with bright stars and the moon, which looked big and bright and more beautiful than usual. I went back inside to the staff room to eat one of the sandwiches my dad had brought for us. After that, I went back to start cleaning out the pens in stable one and two. These stables had slatted floors that could be opened to scrape down any dung and straw, which was then automatically transported out to the open manure tank on the backside. Because of the freezing temperature, I first had to go out on the back to start a circulation pump to keep the liquid manure from freezing in the pipes. I went out the back, opened the hatch to the control panel, and started the pump. I then closed the hatch, and I looked across the manure tank at the pig lying there in the snow. A dim light shone through the windows from the lights inside and from the moon lighting up the area. The snow under the pig's head was now colored red, and I actually felt a bit relieved that he was no longer in pain. I went back inside, starting to clean out the pins, after about half an hour, I'd finished the two stables. My dad and sister weren't back from the workshop yet, so I decided to go to the staff room to have a Coke from the refrigerator and watch some TV until they came back. We still had some work to do, but I felt I deserved a break. They'd probably be back any minute. After a few minutes of watching some boring reality show and drinking Coke and having my second sandwich, I remembered I left the circulation pump to the manure tank on out back. I put down my sandwich and went out to the corridor towards the back door to turn it off. I opened the back door, 
stepping out, and I was just about to open the hatch to the control panel when I saw something moving in the corner of my right eye just across the manure tank. I looked over towards it, and immediately my heart felt as if it stopped. My entire body froze from fear. What I saw was something I had never seen before, something I hope against hope that I'll never have to see again. Over on the other side of the manure tank, there was a huge animal leaning over the carcass of the pig we'd left out there earlier in the day. The animal faced away from me, so I could only see its back. At first, I thought it was a brown bear, but it was way bigger, and it had a tail with long hair on it, like the tail of a golden retriever. This animal was covered in dark gray and black fur, with a wide, muscular upper body, and I could see the steam from its breath rising in the cold air. Suddenly, the animal stood up on its hind legs. It really was huge. I would guess maybe 220 to 240 centimeters tall. It turned its head slightly to the right, nose towards the sky, and it opened its mouth to toss a piece of meat down its throat. The head was definitely the head of a wolf, but much bigger and darker. It had long furry ears pointing upwards and a long snout with big canine teeth. We have both wild wolves and bears living in this area, but this, oh, this was something else, something bigger, stronger, something that gave off an evil vibe. The animal leaned down over the pig carcass again, continuing to feast on its meal. I realized it hadn't yet noticed me standing there outside the door behind it. I was so scared. I didn't know if I should scream, cry, or faint. My body was still frozen and just wouldn't move. Finally, I found the strength to silently walk backwards inside and softly close and lock the door. Even when I was inside, I tried to run through the corridor as quietly as possible to lock the front door as well. I did not want to give that monster any chance to get inside. I walked over to the door to stable number two that had windows facing the back side where the creature had been. I looked into the stable through the window in the door. The windows in the wall were about two meters up from the floor. From there, I could only see the steam from its breath rising in the air outside. Suddenly, some of the pigs saw me through the door window and started to grunt loudly. Soon, all of them were grunting very loud as they always do when they see a person at the door. They were excited, hoping I was bringing them more food. I looked back to the windows, just in time to see the creature stand up and turn towards the window, looking in the direction of the sound of the pigs. I could only see the top of its head and the ears when it walked up to the window. I quickly sat down on the floor in front of the door, and now, silently, I cried. I started to crawl on the floor back to the staff room to get to the phone and call my dad. Remember, this was around the year 2000, when a 12-year-old wouldn't have a mobile phone. I reached the door and realized that there are two big windows in the staff room, windows that didn't have any curtains or blinds. I didn't dare go inside, risking that the creature would turn up on the front side of the building and see me through the window. I sat down in the corner between the doors to the staff room and the front door. At that point, I could not hold it in anymore. I began to cry like never before. I was sure this monster would get inside, and if it did, it would hear me crying, and it would find me. Suddenly, the door handle on the front door violently turned, and something tried to push the door open. I screamed, and the handle turned again followed by two loud thuds and an attempt to break the door open. I was sure then that I was going to die. When the door handle turned once more, I heard hard knocking on the door, followed by my dad's voice calling out for me. I rushed up, unlocking and opening the door, 
telling my dad and sister to hurry inside and to lock the door after they did. When I turned to my dad, he saw that I'd been crying, and he asked what was wrong. I told him the whole story of what I called the werewolf, and he looked at me, not saying a word, then looked at my sister. He looked back at me and asked if I am done feeding and cleaning the pens. I nodded. He nodded back, thoughtfully looking down at the floor for a few seconds, then back at us, telling us that the rest of the work can wait until tomorrow. Then he took us back home. In the evening, he went by himself to give the pigs their evening meal. My sister and I watched him from the upper floor of the house as he walked across the yard, hoping that the creature would not be hiding in the dark, ready to attack my dad. I remember him looking all around him with a flashlight as he walked. When he came back, I asked if he had seen the dead pig on the back side. He said he had, rather what was left of it. He said it looked as if some sort of predator had found it and dragged the rest of it into the forest. After that incident, my dad was very clear we were not allowed to go outside after dark. As I got older, I've been thinking a lot about that day and how my dad reacted after I told him what happened, followed by the new strict rules about never going outside after dark. Did he know this creature existed? Did he know that it lurked in the forests surrounding the farm? Had he seen it himself? My dad later passed away from leukemia some years later, before I had a chance to ask him about it. But I'm sure he knew something about the creature I saw that day. The Visitors From Motto Man I recently came across a listing for 40 acres of recreational land in a heavily forested area of Utah, approximately 9,000 feet above sea level. It was a great deal, only about 1,000 bucks an acre, since the land had no utilities prepared and it wouldn't be ready to build on for years. It shared a border with approximately 2 million acres of BLM land, miles of forest that would never be torn down nor harvested. It was perfect. A friend and I made a deal. We would go 50-50 on the land. We split the property, but agreed we had no issue sharing our halves with each other since we were friends and we wanted our families to always have fun experiences camping out there. Afterwards, I parked a camper on the land. We also split the cost on building a rustic cabin, basically a 400 square foot cabin with a wood-burning stove, a porch, and some bunk beds. It took us some time to build the cabin, and we stayed in the camper during construction. Once finished, we decided to spend the night in the cabin. That first night, we stayed up late, talking about how we were excited to make the trip home and bring our families back for our first camping trip together. At some point, we must have fallen asleep. I awoke to the sound of someone rummaging through the back of my truck. We were a mile or two from the next parcel that we knew someone else owned, so I was shocked someone was in our camp. I quietly woke up my buddy. The rummaging sounds continued, followed by the sound of my suspension squeaking and hearing footsteps walk closer to the cabin. I could then hear deep breathing. Whatever it was coming from sounded powerful. We'd built the cabin one foot off the ground. We cut out a window approximately six feet high, seven feet high at the top of the window. It was a full moon and our campground was well lit. We listened as the footsteps got closer, slowly, until I could see a large figure of a man with long mangy hair standing in the window frame, just breathing. Again, you would have to be at least six feet tall just to be visible in that window. This was a big dude. In an attempt to dispel our fear, my friend yelled out, Who are you? We're armed! The figure then turned and walked away, never to visit us again. The next morning, 
We found they, or it maybe, had thrown everything out of my truck, leaving all the valuables behind. We found very large handprints on the windows of my truck, probably 40 to 50% bigger than my friend's hand, who's also a large man. We're beginning to think that perhaps who we encountered wasn't human. And if he didn't take anything, what was he looking for? The Pinion Skinwalker From Siena Almost a year ago, I used to live in a somewhat isolated little neighborhood that was in the high desert of California. I lived on a dirt road, and since the homes were so spread out, wildlife wasn't an uncommon thing. You would see rabbits, coyotes, snakes, and on rare occurrences, deer. Once you've lived there for a while, you get used to the animals roaming around during the late hours of the day. I'm Native American, so most of the time I actually enjoyed seeing the wildlife so close to home. But I always have known of a creature my tribe refers to as Skinwalker. I'm not even supposed to say that word, but it was typed, so hopefully there's no bad omen. That creature is what I think I saw in this encounter. The house I lived at had a very large backyard and a driveway made of gravel mixed with dirt, leaving a lot of open space to look out from. My room was at the front of the house, and every night if I had my window open, I would find myself staring out to the front gate of our driveway. It was very quiet every night, unless you heard coyote howls. There was a lot of strange things up there, and I wasn't the only one who experienced some of them. My boyfriend and my mother did as well. My mother has her own story, but I'll be telling mine today. At the time, I was homeschooled. I was sitting in the office in silence, just doing some of my work. In the silence, I swear I suddenly heard a knock coming from the window, but I couldn't see out this window because we didn't have blinds or curtains. Instead, we had these sliding barred doors as windows instead. Even so, I turned my head in that direction. Then it fell silent again. Not long after, I began to hear someone or something walking. It was a crunching sound. After all, all we had outside the window was gravel. These were very obviously footsteps, but not those from a rabbit or coyote. It was something heavier. I froze because I didn't know what to do. Whatever was outside the window might be able to hear me. After maybe five minutes, I left my computer and I stayed in my room for the rest of the day. A month or two after this, I changed rooms with the office to make it my bedroom. My previous bedroom was too small and my father thought I needed more room. One night, I was looking out the same window that I heard the footsteps at. It was dark out and difficult to see much. I was staring out at the gate, which blocks the opening to the driveway. I sometimes enjoyed looking out at the night sky, but this time I didn't. After sitting there for about ten minutes stargazing, I saw a figure on the other side of the gate. At first it looked like a coyote, but it was far too long, and the way it moved it was so unnatural. It looked like a human walking on all fours trying to imitate the way a dog moves. I wasn't scared at first, so I just waited to see what it was going to do. For a moment, it was just walking past the gate like a normal coyote or dog, but then it turned its head to look at the house, and I realized it was now looking at me. I could just tell. I couldn't see its eyes. It was just a black, lanky silhouette of a coyote-shaped thing. Just typing this out makes me feel uneasy. It stood there, still as a statue, when suddenly it stood up on its hind legs and it tried to climb over our freaking gate. I lost it then. I rushed to shut the barn door window, but that just seemed to make it angry. It began to scramble to climb faster. Before long, it had made it on our side of the gate, I heard it running towards my window before I finally 
shut it. Just in time. As the window shut, the sounds outside suddenly stopped. I heard absolutely nothing for the rest of the night other than my own breathing. I had many other experiences in that house, but that was the last time I kept my window open at night. I haven't seen that creature since, and I'm happy I haven't. Once we moved, I was sad, and I still miss that house. I considered it my real home, but I'm thankful I won't have to see that thing ever again. Visit in the Woods From Hunter L. The woods can be a very scary place. I know this well. I adore being out in the woods during hunting season. I've seen and heard some creepy things in the woods, but there's something different about this particular instance. Hunting season was just over a month ago now as of writing this, but this experience has literally changed my life. I had been sitting in a ground blind in a part of the woods that branched out from the wood line, a small patch of wooded area that reached out about halfway between the rest of the wood line and the road, with a field on either side. Behind me was a swale, which is a sunken port of marshy bit of land, for those who don't know. And to my left, about twenty yards or so, was a bit of a ravine, about five feet deep, with a creek running through the bottom of it, and an easy slope down to the bottom. This ravine was parallel to the north wall of my blind, but then curved slightly and would flatten out a bit more to the east. My blind was maybe a third of the way from the wood line to the end of this, well, we'll call it a finger of the woods. My blind is octagonal and has four windows, little flaps with latches to keep them up in the closed position. It was situated such that every window faced a cardinal direction. Primarily, I was sitting facing eastward farther into the woods, with the road directly behind me a good 130 yards back or so. The door to enter the blind was behind me and to my left. By this point, the wind had picked up and was blowing from the north, so I had closed that window and always kept the window facing the road closed, for obvious firearm safety reasons. After sitting in that blind for about two hours that morning, Without so much as a squirrel sighting, I began to hear these footsteps. I think that's what they were. Leaves crunching from something and all that. It was behind me, slightly to the left. This struck me as a little odd, because it sounded too close, like I should have been hearing it much sooner than that. I figured it must have been coming up from the swale behind me. That is a popular area for deer to bed down in so I got ready to shoot once it entered my vision. But I couldn't turn myself around, as that would make too much noise, and I'd have to open one or two windows, which would scare off the supposed deer. But this was not a deer. It sounded like human strides. They were a bit too heavy to be a deer, too. I wasn't immediately concerned. I guessed my father had come to check on me or something like that. But then I realized... No, he absolutely would have called or texted me before making a hike from his blind to mine. Then I thought maybe another friend of ours who we frequently hunted with was coming to check the blind. I was right near his tree stand after all. I even wondered if this was the game warden who had been very active this season. Either way, the footsteps seemed to get right to the door of my blind, maybe four feet back from it. Assuming this was a person, I simply reached over and unlatched one of the windows to peek out that way, since opening the door to the blind was rather arduous. I would have had to open all the little latches in the dark. When I looked outside the blind window, I saw to my surprise absolutely nothing. There was no human, no animal, nothing standing where I'd heard those footsteps. Deciding I was simply freaking myself out over nothing, I closed the window again, and I got situated back in my chair. A few seconds later, the footsteps started again. They walked past the door and were directly to my left. They were clear as day. No question about it, something was moving outside my blind. 
I quickly reached over and opened the window again, quickly seeing no one and even looking around in the ground, thinking it might be a squirrel or even a chipmunk jumping through the leaves. But again, no person, no animal, nothing. I was shocked. I'd heard those footsteps clearer than ever. They had sounded no more than three feet away from me. I could have reached my arm out the window, swung it about a bit, and I would have been touching whatever was out there. How could I not see anything? Thoroughly spooked, I got chills and closed that window again, sitting back down and waiting. Sure enough, before long, the footsteps picked up again. They walked forward, but didn't go far enough that they entered my vision. They veered off to the left, away from me, heading northeast. I didn't even bother trying to look this time, not right away at least. After a few moments, I heard them begin down the slope into the ravine and walk right down to the creek at the base of it. I peeked out in that direction by leaning far forward in my blind, and I could see where they were coming from. But whatever this was would have been in the ravine, out of my sight. The footsteps got down to a particular section of the creek, stopped, and I never heard them again. In the moment, my mind was racing with thoughts like, what was that? Was it real? Is it still down there? But then I realized something. Roughly eight years ago, a friend of ours had passed away. An older man, the father of the friend I mentioned earlier, in fact, whose tree stand was nearby. After his passing, he was cremated, and we spread his ashes. We spread them in the very creek I'd heard the footsteps vanish in, the exact spot where the footsteps stopped. Suddenly, I knew exactly what I heard, who I heard. I knew the old hoot was checking who was in the blind. I'm sure he was happy to see the young blood, the new generation as he liked to call me, sitting in that blind, keeping the tradition going. Not all ghost experiences have to be scary or malicious. Some can even be comforting. For me, this one certainly was. Something got in my house. From Sunshine. This happened to me a few years ago in my own house. I live in a little town mostly run by farmers and country folk out in Texas. I literally live in the middle of nowhere, and I mean it. Just beyond my backyard is several hundred acres of pasture, and right across my driveway is a few miles of dense woodland. I do a lot of hiking and fishing on my property, and I've seen and heard a lot, but this story is a bit different. Now I live with my family, which consists of my parents and my little sister. The floors in our house are very creaky and loud. It's pretty much impossible to sneak around anywhere. One day I was going on a little nature walk on a path my dad made us ages ago through the woods. That particular day, something felt wrong. The entire time I was out there, I felt as if I was being watched. My sister was with me too, and she felt the same way. The woods were just too quiet, so we decided to head home early. That night, our dogs were going insane. At the time, we had a Great Dane, a Great Pyrenees, an Aussie Shepherd, a Pitbull Terrier mix, and two Chihuahuas. So, as you can imagine, a bit of barking can be pretty normal. But this time... They would run from our front door to the back door over and over again. My dad would go outside with a flashlight and walk around the house to check things out, but he never did find anything. We decided to let our big dogs run outside for the night, something we didn't normally do. We were worried someone or something was going to try to hurt our outside animals or rob us if we did. It isn't overly common in our region, but our neighbors had been broken into less than a month before so we didn't want to take any chances, considering we had a lot of expensive ranching equipment and our animals are our babies. After a while, the dogs settled down, and everyone went to bed. Early in the morning, around 5 a.m., when it was still dark out, I woke up to my bedroom door slowly opening. 
and I heard someone calling my name. I was still very much half asleep. It usually takes me all morning and a cup of coffee to wake me up, especially before 8. So my vision was pretty blurry, and I wasn't processing things well. I could hear my dogs going insane outside somewhere, but I didn't realize at the moment that it meant there was something wrong. My little sister poked her head into my room, not even enough for me to see her neck. Then she waved at me. She whispered my name repeatedly, which only got a hum out of me. Hey, you need to come outside. You have to see this. Hurry. I remember wiping my eyes to try to clear them, because my sister had very dark hair, but that night she looked blonde. The only blonde person I knew at the time was my best friend, who came over pretty often, but I knew she wouldn't be spending the night with us, so I was confused. The person at my door looked like a combination of my best friend and my little sister. What are you doing up? I asked. But my sister didn't answer my question. Instead, she just said, Hurry up. I have to show you what's outside. If you don't come, you're going to miss it. Then she began hysterically giggling. I told her to go away and rolled over. I remember then hearing my parents' door open. The girl at my door giggled again, then slammed the door hard enough to shake the wall. I jumped, nearly falling out of bed, just in time to hear heavy and loud footsteps run straight out the back door. I got up and walked into my kitchen to see my dad standing there. Who was in our house just now? He asked, not even looking at me. I turned to look in my sister's room, but she had just walked out to see what the commotion was. Our back door was wide open, the lock completely broken apart, and I could see our dogs tearing after something in the distance. I think that was the moment that it hit me. Something that sounded like my sister and resembled two different people I knew was just inside our house talking to me. On top of that, it was trying to lure me outside. After that, we increased security at our house. We installed alarms, new very heavy locks, electric wire on our fences, and cameras around the house, shed, and barns. A while after this, my sister told me something similar happened to her, but she saw a taller and darker version of my dad. She said he told her the exact same things to try to lure her outside. Less than a month after that, we saw someone walking around our farthest barn. They appeared to be about six feet tall, nude, and really pale. The cameras were so blurry it was hard to tell anything else. We saw it scratch the barn door for a minute before my dogs found it and ran it off. My dad thought that some naked druggie had showed up, but like I said, we lived in the middle of nowhere. That would be a long walk for anybody especially a drugged-out person with no shoes in the cold. I have reason to believe this thing was a skinwalker who just kept coming back. That was definitely a while ago, but just the other night, we saw someone walking across our field in the distance. Whoever it was, or whatever it was, screamed and ran into the woods. I'm scared it came back. If you've got a similar story, please share it with me. If you've figured out how to get rid of it, I'd love to know. I just want this thing to leave us alone. Stinker in the Fields From R.D. in a Hall The following story happened in 2002, in September, just after the film Signs had been released in movie theaters in the UK. For context, at the time, I was a relatively poor student whose only real expense was a monthly subscription membership to the local cinema, which allowed me to watch unlimited movies as often as I wanted, provided they were open and there were showings and seats available. It wasn't a bad deal, I will admit. I used that membership regularly. On the night in question, I had decided, having nothing better to do and being somewhat bored, my university housemates were away visiting family, 
I would go and see the midnight showing of signs. Yeah, I know. I'm already raising typical horror trope red flags, seeing a somewhat creepy movie at midnight. I took what little spare cash I had, went to see the movie, and rather foolishly decided to spend that money, which I should have saved for a taxi fare, to instead treat myself to some decent food and drink with which to enjoy the movie. Much better than the sorry half-empty bottle of Dr. Pepper and cheap bag of sweets I'd smuggled in. So when the movie ended, when people were shuffling out to go home just after 2 a.m., I had no other option but to walk back home. Being younger and significantly more foolish, I didn't really think much of this. I really didn't consider that a three-mile walk through relatively long, isolated roads past a number of fields in the slight chill of the dead night would pose much of a risk to me. I knew roughly where I was going. It was a simple straight line route that I'd gone through by car or bus a number of times before, so I didn't consider it much of an issue. More red flags, I know. At this point, pretty much every horror movie protagonist would be facepalming hard. So I set off, starting down the footpath onto the long road, where there was very quickly no footpath or pavement just a very long stretch of overgrown grassy verge leading down to ditches which bordered a built-up wooded area and a number of empty fields. Huh, empty fields, just after seeing a horror movie involving aliens, crop circles, and large crop fields. I will admit, as I walked down that road with the fresh chill in the air, my mind was going that extra creeped out mile imagining the worst, remembering bits from the movie, and on occasion, looking about to make sure I wasn't about to see a grey shuffling through the crops. You see, the area I live in is something of a strange hotspot for unexplained phenomena, including UFO sightings. But thankfully, as I walked down the long stretch of road, there were no extraterrestrial sightings. A relief. But, there was something else. The early hours of the morning are generally quiet. You wouldn't expect to hear much more than the odd hoot of an owl or the odd noises of foxes, cats, or hounds from nearby built-up areas. And, as I was walking past a significant wooded area, past a number of ditches and fields, I was expecting to hear something at least. But after about ten minutes of walking... I realized I was hearing nothing. No hoots, no yips, nor growls, no snorts. Nothing. I stopped then, looking about, shivering a bit due to the cold air. It felt off, intimidating even. After a few moments, I did hear something. A mysterious shuffling sound in the field just across the road from myself. The sound of crop stems crunching, like they were being trodden over by something large. But there was no one else around. Not a car on the road, not a person in the area. Just dim streetlights and a long stretch of nothing. Uncomfortably, I decided to continue on, knowing that I was probably fairly close to the leisure center slash gym that indicated the only real turn of my journey and the start of another long stretch of road, which would eventually lead to civilization. Hopefully, whatever I'd heard would be content to stay behind in those fields. Maybe it was a deer. Maybe it was some unseen barnyard critter put out to field that I couldn't make out in the dark. But as I continued on, as I continued to walk, I heard the sounds, the crunching, the shuffling, continuing alongside me. It was still quiet, still cold. The silence was still heavy in the air elsewhere. At this point, I was beginning to pick up my pace, hoping that whatever seemed to be following me would be content to stay in the fields, or even better, stuck there behind the chicken wire fence, tatty barbed wire, and dodgy electric fences that bordered them. But after a few moments, the sounds continued, picking up pace themselves. 
Now, I know it wasn't me. I wasn't hearing an echo of myself. I was walking in sneakers on a damp, grassy verge. Nothing was going to crunch that loudly, and I certainly wasn't that heavy. I paused again then, looking about once more, peering towards the fields as I slowly kept walking along the verge on the opposite side of the road. It was then that I saw it. The initial sighting is best described as a fairly large black shape moving along the edge of the field. I couldn't quite see all of it. I didn't really have much in the form of a flashlight, and mobile phones back then were, well, dimly lit green screens at best. So I was catching fleeting glances between the overlapping streetlights. It was moving along the edge, moving in the same direction as me. I couldn't quite make out what it was at that particular moment. It was just big and moving with me. Swallowing nervously, I decided to turn and sprint. I reminded myself I simply needed to get to the leisure center, and from there it would be civilization. An abundance of light, plenty of other people, drunks even. But as I sprinted, as my heart raced, I heard it. The shuffling, the snapping, a sound of wire fence rattling and shaking as something climbed straight over it as though it wasn't even a bother. As I ran, I heard the sounds across the road from me, where the fields were starting to disappear into ditches, another grassy verge with hedgerows and small bushes as a backdrop as we started to get to housing areas. It was also then that the smell hit, a foul, rotten, sulfurous stench wafting in my direction as the wind blew it down toward me. I gagged and I stumbled stopping just by the walls of the leisure center. I looked across the way, and I could see it more clearly now. A large black shape covered in scraggly fur, but with a distinctly canine silhouette. It loped along, going from all fours to upright to all fours at its own whim, and I could hear it panting, sniffing as it looked toward me with gold-red eyes, one thought came to my mind when I saw it. Werewolf. It really did look much like the stereotypical wolfman. But it was also at this point I realized I was in trouble. I was in danger. I was exhausted and burnt out. I could no longer run. I was cold sweating, and this thing was slowly approaching me. But I was at just the junction I needed to get to. Cross the road and I was in built-up areas, able to follow a footbridge to houses, then down the main road to home. Determined to get somewhere, hoping light or at least something would deter the thing following me, I decided to cross the road. Thankfully, this was the moment that I would get lucky. My attention was solely on this creature, so I didn't notice the lorry driving fairly slowly at night, coming round the roundabout, not immediately noticing me either. Thankfully, the driver was not going that fast, so seeing an exhausted man slowly making his way across the road, he was able to stop in time, luckily for me. The lorry stopped, the driver leaning out to shout profanities at me, and I looked at him, trying to apologize. Then I froze. The stinker, the creature, was approaching behind the lorry, but as the driver continued to shout, it seemed the stinker was somewhat put off. There was a loud thunk as it jumped up onto the back of the lorry, causing the driver to stop and look at me. Hey, you see that? Yeah, I see it. I couldn't describe it. I was shook, watching as the driver stood and tried to peer around the cab to see what was now on the roof of the trailer. We both watched the stinker lope along the trailer before jumping down past the driver, between myself and the lorry. It looked at me one last time, then darted off toward the ditch in the direction of the river, and more importantly, the local drain. Myself and the lorry driver looked to each other, shaking our heads. We both agreed. Probably a, uh, a big stray dog. 
but both of us knew what we saw wasn't right. The rest of my trip home was fairly uneventful. I got in just past 3.30 a.m., clamoring up the stairs to my room to collapse and sleep the following day away. I didn't mention this to anyone. I figured these circumstances were just too many red flags and nobody would believe. Some 20 years later, after health issues, I decided to embrace my old love of the paranormal, of cryptids, doing some local research out of curiosity. Old Stinker is Hull's local werewolf, having been spotted for a number of decades. Its name comes from the smell, the rotting, sulfurous stench of its breath. It's been spotted along the industrial estates, particularly along the Barnston Drain, where the route I'd taken that night was fairly close to. I'd been hunted by Old Stinker, stalked in the cold night, and only escaped due to circumstantial luck. I suppose he thought that one lone student may have been easy prey, but throw in a lorry and an irate yelling man, and it's no longer so easy. For that, I am thankful. I will say that since this encounter, I made it a point to not walk long distances in the middle of the night through lonely back roads. It's one thing to stumble back through built-up areas where there's CCTV on every corner and plenty of people around at all hours, be they drunk, homeless, or stumbling home just as you are, opposed to walking back in dead silence through poor lighting, no cameras, and the chance the last things to see you alive might be a sheep or a pony. Behind the Mound From Murthra When I was 19, I used to drive a semi with my dad as my team driver. We drove for a small company that often had us in the northeastern United States. My story takes place in a small town in Minnesota. At the time, I was only about 150 pounds and 5 foot 6. Not at all big compared to my fellow truckers. My dad and I had just dropped our trailer off at its destination. We then headed to a local little restaurant that had truck parking while we waited for the phone call with the assignment of our next load. There was enough room for maybe 10 trucks there, so we backed into a spot that was between two other trucks. My dad headed into the restaurant to get us a table, while I let my dog out to use the restroom. My dog was just a small shih tzu, so she often rode with us, and she didn't take up much space and always slept on the top bunk with me. I put on my coat, then put her harness and coat on her, and carried her out, sitting her down on the ground before closing the door. This place only had one kind of dim street lamp lighting up the whole parking lot, but I didn't mind. We had been to the place numerous times and I was comfortable here. Maybe a little too comfortable. I had a routine I followed at this restaurant. I would walk her around behind the parked trucks, let her do her business, then finish walking around the front of the trucks, back to ours. I would pick her up and carry her back into the truck, take her stuff off, and join my dad inside for some coffee and a hot meal. As I placed her onto the ground, I noticed a dirt mound behind the trucks as a result of the plows clearing snows from the unpaved parking lot. This mound had a gap in it between our rig and the one beside us on the passenger side. I used the gap to walk my dog behind the trucks. She'd only peed here, so I continued to walk her around to the front side of the trucks. As we rounded the front side, she stopped to do her business again, then sniffed around as I used a bag to clean up after her. Once I tied it shut, I started to walk back to our truck. However, my dog stayed where she was. I tried coaxing her to follow me, but she wouldn't budge. I thought maybe her paws just had gotten too cold, so I picked her up and began to carry her. Bitsy, what's gotten into you? I asked and she squirmed and grumbled in my arms. With her being so small, I was able to keep hold of her until we turned to go between the trucks. That's when she jumped out of my arms as we reached the door to our semi. Worried the fall might have hurt her, I quickly turned in her direction, only to see her now growling and showing her little teeth. I thought she was mad at me at first. I started to apologize for dropping her, 
when I began to hear a scuffling sound. I spun around to face the noise, which was coming from the dirt mound. As I did, a large man rushed forward with something in his hand. Before I could identify the object, he struck me in the face with it just above my right eye, with so much force I was knocked to the ground. At that point, all I heard was my dog snarling and the man yelling. I tried to move, but the pain in my head caused my vision to go dark. The man had dropped what he was holding then. I later found out that it was a large rock. I then began to hear what must have been his pant leg ripping from my dog's bite. As I heard his footsteps run away, I forced myself to my feet and I grabbed my dog, getting us both into our truck as fast as I could. I looked around then. I didn't know where this man had gone, but I knew I had to tell my dad what happened. I searched for any sight of the man. Upon seeing no signs of him, I ran as fast as I could into the restaurant, found my dad, and immediately broke down crying, telling him what happened. My dad and the owner of the restaurant rushed outside, only to see the taillights of a semi kicking up dirt as he made a fast exit out of the parking lot. When the two of them came back in, the owner was on the phone with the police, and my dad sat beside me, hugging me until the cops showed up. The officers took pictures of my head, where a nice-sized lump had formed, accompanied by a cut. Once they wrote down my statement, they had me go outside and show them where the attack took place. They told me they believed it was another trucker that attacked me, and my dog was probably the only thing that saved me from whatever plans he'd had. Unfortunately, that restaurant didn't have security cameras in place at the time, but they later would install some covering the parking lot. Sadly, they never found my attacker, but my dog ate like a queen that night. It was the least I could do to repay her for saving my life. Sasquatch is real. From Shroomer. This story was shared with me from someone else. I first heard the story about 10 years back, but the actual account happened long before its telling. I live on Vancouver Island, a small island located in the Pacific Ocean, just off mainland Canada, just a stone's throw across the border of Washington State. My longtime girlfriend of the time was First Nations, having been raised on the far west coast of Vancouver Island here in British Columbia. We decided to take a small vacation, to spend a relaxing weekend in the small coastal town of Tofino, found on the far west coast of the island. I have many stories about working, living, and the strange encounters I have experienced there, helping to fuel my natural curiosity towards that area. But this story has always stuck with me. At the end of this vacation, we were headed back to our home on the eastern side, and while driving through Cathedral Grove, one of the old growth forests left on the island, my girlfriend suggested we stop into the major town of Port Alberni while passing through. She wanted to stop and see her uncle's family, who she hadn't seen in years, since they had all moved from the coastal village inland. I agreed, and after another hour worth of driving in darkness, by 8pm, we found ourselves parked just outside their humble home, just on the outskirts of the small port town. I'd never met these relatives before, but on the trip there, my girlfriend had proceeded to give me the rundown on her uncle and aunt. After much conversation, it had come to my attention that her uncle was the blood hereditary chieftain of the tiny village in which she was raised. We walked into their rustic kitchen, which could be entered from the back door of the house, to see her aunt Kathy quaintly baking cookies for our arrival. She had already removed them from the oven, placing them onto a cooling rack. She began to introduce herself while ushering us to sit down at the dinner table. After a brief introduction, we had come to discover that none of my girlfriend's cousins were at home at the time. They were away at a basketball tournament, leaving only her and Arthur there. After some talking between the two, Kathy stood up and loaded a handful of cookies onto a small plate. With an inviting smile while placing the plate into my hands, she asked if I could take the plate of cookies down the hallway to the living room, where Arthur was sitting watching TV. The two women began discussing about the local community powwow and turned their attention from me, which was my cue to exit. I clutched the circular plate of cookies, 
and walked down the extended dark hallway that led to the large living room that could be entered from the home's front door. Nervously, I tightly gripped the plate of cookies, then proceeded to casually enter the open living space. There, in the far side of the room, sat Uncle Arthur, very silent and stoic, watching the news on the TV from his dark brown lounging chair. He possessed strong features and tired eyes on a hardened exterior, a man who had not only seen many things, but lived them as well. I came quietly into the room, sitting the plate of cookies onto the burl wood table, which lay in between his lounger chair and the couch. I proceeded to introduce myself to him. He asked if I would mind taking a seat at the end of the couch next to him, so we could speak. I agreed and sat on the couch seat directly next to the large lounger. He began to ask me many questions about myself, as well as to where we had just come from on our vacation to stop by their place. I explained we had wanted to take a small vacation on the coast of the island to see the village where my girlfriend had grown up. We then had a wonderful conversation covering many topics associated with the small village where he had been chief for many years. Insightful discussions about raising kids, the local wildlife, the region itself, and much more. He seemed to relish the chance to share much of the small village's quiet history with me, as well as the time in which the family had resided there. Time passed quickly in enjoyment, until after a particular conversation we were having about the mountain trail which we hiked when we were at the village a few days prior. Arthur quickly went silent, as his look of enjoyment in the conversation changed suddenly into one of stoic silence like the one he possessed when I'd first walked in. I was completely puzzled by the quick 180 degree turn in his attitude, wondering if I had said something out of line, something that may have offended him. He then raised the television remote up to the TV, switching it off. The sound of the crackling fire was the only sound left to be heard as we sat in silence. At this point, I was stumped, as to what had occurred to cause this silent tension. He leaned forward in his chair, then rubbed his strong chin. His eyes returned to mine where he sternly asked me, Did she take you up the forest trail, the one that goes to the Red Rock? He was referring to an area close to the village, along the river, where a monstrous red stone boulder extended off the top of a small cliff face, overlooking the flowing river, that the children used to play on in the hot summer months. I thought through my memories, and I was correct that we had indeed hiked that exact trail through the heavy forested terrain up to the stone in question. Arthur shook his head in a slow accepting motion as he let out a deep sigh. He paused for a moment, then leaned forward close to me. Do you plan on going there again? He boldly asked. I wasn't sure of how to answer, as I wasn't sure of the context of his questions or the tone in which the conversation had quickly flipped to. I then told him that I indeed had planned on coming back for a similar vacation, as the surfing and fishing in the area was great, plus the nostalgia alone for my girlfriend returning to the village with her childhood memories made the trip all worth it. He took a moment of silence before beginning to speak once more. I can tell your heart is true, you respect the earth, and that you are good to my niece. I want you to be extremely careful when going into the mountains by way of the river, especially at night. He spoke as he sat back in his chair, removing the armed forces ball cap from his head and giving the thinning hair in his scalp a jostle. At this point I was stone silent and completely stunned toward what he had just said to me, and to the idea of what could possibly follow up his last remark. It is my duty as chief to give you my blessing in returning to that trail, to walk it freely without harm, and to allow you safe passage from the Seishak. If you have respect for them and their home, they will mean you no harm. I was completely hooked on his every word, and found myself needing more clear answers asking him as to what exactly a, say, shock was. Arthur then explained to me that in rough translation of the language, say shock meant wild man, 
in his native tongue. He said they were a small group of humanoid creatures that stood bipedally with large feet, standing around seven to nine feet tall. They're covered from head to foot, almost entirely in hair. I personally better knew them by the name of Sasquatch. Chieftains through the history of the tribe would pass the story down, speaking about the existence of these forest protectors. They were said to be covered in a thick mat of brown or sandy-colored fur, depending on age and gender of the creature in question. It's supposed to act as camouflage against the thick forest, allowing them to pass unseen even right in front of the naked eye. They would leave tracks so large, frogs could seek shelter in rain puddles found within after the rain. Arthur sat forward in his chair, looking at me with seriousness, then asked, Do you believe in what I've told you? I didn't believe in any of it myself. That was when I was a kid, and my grandfather and father used to tell me the story. I accepted it as fact because of our culture, but in the back of my mind it did leave a questioning in myself to some capacity about its existence. That was until one October night, when I went up that same mountain trail to Red Rock, following the river to catch the migrating salmon during the autumn spawning run. He explained that on one night of spearfishing, he had taken the river trail much farther than Red Rock. The moon was full, making night fishing and following the path farther into the dark woods that much easier as he walked farther than he normally would. I followed the river until I finally stopped when the river reached a 120 degree bend, causing the speed of the water to rapidly change through the rocks to a much slower pace. I began fishing, and I fished into the night, catching enough fish for my family and the neighbors. I've always loved spearfishing, standing in the thigh-high current, watching the reflection of the large moon against the surface, feeling the cool water slowly flowing past me, reflecting on my own personal journey. He cleared his throat and went on, telling me about how, around two in the morning, he noticed an eerie hush falling across the mountains, something he had never experienced before. He said it was like the entire mountain and forest began to hold its breath, with him waist deep in the water. Then something caught my eye, drawing my attention to the heavy woods that stood on the higher elevated plateau to my north-northwest, approximately 30 yards away. I could see some reflected eye shine bright yellow-greenish, coming from the darkness of the grove. These eyes were staring directly at me, not moving a single muscle, after rustling the large cedar branches. Had it not been for the large moon that night, and the couple of hours given my eyes to adapt to the night, I would have never even known it was there. I stood in the river, my body colder than the water itself, as I started to steady my own breathing lowering the fishing spear in my hands towards my waist. I continued to watch as I began to focus in on the details of the figure that stood hidden amidst the shadows. I could tell the figure was staring directly at me, with the soft greenish eye shine allowing the true focus of the creature to be known. I could feel the unnerving sensation the animal projected towards me as I stared into its eyes until I fully lowered the fishing spear into the moving current, and I lowered my entire body down into the flowing river. I stayed in that cold water, watching the figure move in my direction along the raised plateau. I could then see more of it as it came within 20 yards of me, never making a sound as it moved. I could tell it was a Seishak, just like my father and grandfather had told me about. Now it was standing only about 15 yards away, blending into the row of large cedar trees that lined the bank of the river. The thing stood about 9 to 10 feet tall, and could be easily missed among the trunks of further trees with its dark and textured fur as I stared in disbelief, my entire body shaking in the moving river. Looking back on the incident, I'm sure it had been near this spot 
as the area was a place where bears would normally hunt for salmon during the day, with the slowing of the current. I remained still for what seemed to be hours in the cold river, watching the large beast constantly scan up and down the river, trying to locate my presence, all the while cautiously creeping forward. My body was shaking and becoming increasingly more cold as I was witnessing the truth in the words my forefather spoke of. That creature just above me cemented my elders' words deeply within me in a time when I questioned my culture most. The wind began to blow a strong breeze from the tidal current that proceeded to carry my scent, causing the creature to quickly turn away from me and disappear into the darkness of the heavy tree cover. I quickly got back up, clutching my spear so tight, my hand trembling, I was sure I was close to hypothermia at that point. I took a moment even still to leave some fish on the riverbank as an offering, and I quickly hurried back towards the village. That's when the howling began. These blood-curdling screams that still haunt me to this day. They echoed through the hills from the other creatures that I'd fell to even see. I trekked as fast as I could down the river path and never went back that way ever since for any reason. I was speechless when Arthur finished speaking. I had no words for the man who wore the seriousness of the story so boldly on his face. He broke silence and continued. The say shock is out there, unseen and always watching. So be careful going out there and proceed with only love in your heart for Mother Nature. Respect the forest with its guardians and you will be granted safety. Don't take this story lightly. The say shock is out there, watching everything. And if you're in its home, you're the same as any creature abiding to the laws of nature. Suddenly, a heavy knock frightened me as I quickly flipped my head to the doorway beside me to see my girlfriend and her auntie. Arthur, are you bothering our guest? Kathy asked with her arms crossed and a smile on her face as my girlfriend stood behind her, explaining it was time to get back on the road. Arthur answered, No, and flicked the TV back on with the remote. Standing up, I extended my hand out to shake goodbye, thanking my host for his time, for the food and the words. Arthur stood up, only to pull me in for a hug instead and patting me on the back. He spoke into my ear, which will stay with me for as long as I live. He simply said, Never forget they're out there, always watching. I thanked Aunt Kathy for the lovely visit to the couple's home, and I said goodbye. We then departed, making our way back home. Since that day, I've met countless others within the various tribal communities which are located up and down the island through many events, all of which have their fair number of locals who often share stories about the population of Sasquatch that call the island forests home. After the many years with my now fiancé, I've seen, heard, and been part of countless Sasquatch experiences, adding my own voice to the many who have had the luck, experience, or spirituality to come across one of these forest guardians. Thanks for listening to my story, and may you all find what it is that you seek. And remember, Sasquatch is real. Lunch Break Road Rage from Michigan Maniac I'm a 25-year-old guy living in southern Michigan. I'm only about a 20-minute drive from the Indiana border to give you some idea of my location. This happened two years ago, in the summer of 2021, while I was working at a Gander Outdoors. If you're not familiar with Gander Outdoors, it's a sporting goods store that was previously known as Gander Mountain before it was bought out by the Camping World family of stores. In fact, shortly after this took place, 
Camping World decided to dissolve their Gander Outdoors stores and get out of the hunting firearm business. I personally worked at the gun counter. Now on to my unnerving experience. I was working the closing shift, which was 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. So come 4 p.m. it was time for my lunch break. I drove three miles down the road to a local ice cream place that also sold bar quality food. I had to take a right turn off the main road to get there, which was a pretty busy road. Lunch was normal. I got my food, sat down at a picnic table in front of the ice cream shop, and ate my lunch. On my way back, I now had to turn left to get back onto the busy main road. Yet, oncoming traffic was making sure I had to wait a bit. In just moments, there was a medium-sized gap between two oncoming cars, and to be honest, I could have made it if I sped up. However, being in an accident myself at one point, and having witnessed half a dozen of them, I decided not to chance it. It was then that a white moving van behind me began to lay down its horn, multiple times for three-second intervals. This seriously struck a nerve. I stuck up my middle finger and hung it out my window. We've all been there, right? I forgot about it pretty quick, finally making a left turn onto the road that would take me back to work. As I pulled into the parking lot, I realized the guy I'd flipped off near the ice cream shop followed me all the way back to my job. I parked, and the white van parked, only two car spots away from me. I got out of my car, locking the door while staring at the driver. He was an older man in his 60s, with shoulder-length yellowish-white hair and a patchy beard. He made eye contact with me as I made my way past his vehicle and into the store. I immediately went into the employee break room, which was directly to the right upon entering the building. I put my blue work shirt back on and clipped a radio to my waistline. Coming out of the break room, I headed towards the firearms counter, which was in the back of the store. There, I found the elderly man again, talking to my coworker Miles. I could see his full figure now. He was five foot four, skinny, with dirty gray sweatpants and a baggy button-up shirt. He glanced over at me and immediately stormed out of the building. Miles then glared at me, asking, Did you do something to tick that guy off? He came in asking for some 38 special ammunition because he was going to teach someone a lesson. Then he was asking if we had any cameras outside. I explained to him what happened, and my coworker's eyes went wide. Dude, you better go out and check to make sure he isn't screwing your car up, he quickly said. I made my way back up to the front of the store, standing right at the door, where I could see the man circling my car with a revolver tucked in his waistband. I was nervous, but I was praying that he wouldn't try anything in broad daylight. I stepped outside, lit a cigarette, and continued to watch him. He must have circled my car about five times before he looked up and saw me. Hesitantly, he started to inch forward with his hand on his waist, and I thought I'd really made a mistake. In a split second, I looked up to a security camera that was, in fact, pointed directly at mine and the man's vehicles. When my eyes returned to the man, he was now also looking at the security camera. He gave me one final, hate-filled glare, his face beat red. His hand came off his waist, and he got back into his van, finally driving off. If it weren't for that security camera, that man just might have had the nerve and the courage to do something very bad to me. All over something stupid. Scary Trucker Story From Anonymous It was a late autumn night, the kind of night where the air was chilly and the stars were crisp and bright. I had been driving my big rig down the highway for hours, my only companions the sound of my engine and the darkness outside. As I drove, my mind wandered, thinking about my family back home and the upcoming holidays. But something caught my eye then, a figure standing on the side of the road. As I approached, I could see that it was a man. His thumb was outstretched, and a backpack was slung over his shoulder. I hesitated for a moment, 
I had heard enough stories about hitchhikers, how they could be dangerous, but I figured I could manage myself. I am no small guy, after all. And besides, the guy did not look too threatening. I pulled over and rolled down the window. Need a lift? I asked. The man didn't say anything. He began to climb into the cab and sat down beside me. I noticed right away that he had a strange, intense look in his eyes, like he was sizing me up, trying to figure me out. But I didn't pay it much mind. Maybe he was just shy. We drove on in silence for a time, the only sounds being the hum of the engine and the occasional rustle of the wind outside. The man didn't say anything, didn't ask where we were headed, didn't make small talk. He was starting to get a little uncomfortable, but I figured he was just tired, or maybe he didn't speak English very well. It was then I noticed something strange. Every time I glanced over at him, he was staring at me. Not a quick glance, a long, hard stare, and there was something in his eyes that made my skin crawl. They were cold and dead, like he didn't have any emotions at all. I tried to focus on the road, but I couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on me. It was like he was trying to read my mind or something, trying to figure out my weaknesses. I started to get nervous, wondering who this guy might be, wondering what he wanted really. As the miles ticked past, the silence grew thicker. I kept stealing glances at him, and he kept staring back. It was like we were locked in some kind of weird staring contest. Then suddenly, he spoke. You ever pick up hitchhikers before? He asked, his voice low and cold. I was taken aback. It was the first thing he'd said in so long. The question seemed to come out of nowhere, but I tried to keep my cool. Uh, not often, I replied. Why do you ask? The man shrugged and went back to staring out the window, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about him. Finally, we came to a rest stop. I pulled in, hoping that the man would get out and be on his way. But he didn't move. He sat there, staring straight ahead with those cold, dead eyes. I was starting to feel trapped. I didn't know what this guy was capable of, and I didn't want to provoke him but I knew I had to do something. Hey, I need to take a leak, I said, trying to sound casual. Wanna get out and stretch your legs? The man shrugged and climbed out of the cab when we parked. I watched him walk around for a bit, trying to get a read on him, but he didn't really do anything suspicious. Just paced back and forth, smoking a cigarette. But then, as he was getting back into the truck, I saw something that made my blood run cold a glint of metal in his backpack. I couldn't quite make out what the metal object was, but it looked sharp and dangerous. My heart began to race, so I tried to think of what to do next. As the man settled back into his seat, I noticed his backpack had shifted slightly, and the metal object was now more visible. It was a hunting knife, its blade glinting in the light of the cab, I felt a cold sweat break out on my forehead as I tried to stay calm. The man seemed to sense my unease, and a small smile played across his lips. You seem nervous, he said, his voice low and menacing. There's something you want to tell me? I tried to play it cool. No, just tired from driving all night, I said, forcing a smile. You want some music? I reached over to turn on the radio, hoping the noise would drown out the pounding of my heart. But as I did, the man's hand shot out and grabbed my wrist, gripping it tightly. I don't like music, he said, his eyes narrowing. I like silence. His grip was like a vice, and I could feel the blood rushing out of my hand. I tried to pull away, but he held on tight. I knew I was in trouble. But suddenly, he let me go. He leaned back in his seat, face relaxed, as if nothing had just happened. You're a good driver, but you gotta learn to relax, he said almost casually. I didn't know what to say. The man was clearly unhinged, but
but I knew nothing about him. At this point, I just wanted to get him out of my truck and get as far away from him as possible. But then something even more terrifying happened. As we drove on, the man began to hum, but it sounded like a more low and guttural sound, like something out of a horror movie. Then he began to sing. It was a song I'd never heard before, but it was both haunting and beautiful. I couldn't take my eyes off of him as he sang, his voice rising and falling in a strange otherworldly cadence. And then, as suddenly as it started, the singing stopped. The man turned to me, his eyes blazing. I'm gonna kill you. Then I'm gonna sing to your soul. I don't remember much after that. I guess I blacked out. What I remember next was waking up in a hospital bed. The doctors told me I'd been found by the side of my road, my truck abandoned, but okay. There was no sign of a man or the knife. To this day, I don't know what happened that night. But I know one thing for sure. I will never pick up another hitchhiker. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at eeriecast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks, add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.